Good afternoon, YouTube. Um, we'll just let the uh, notifications get out there, and then I will um, I will get going. I've got to lift my chair. I mean, it's not high enough. Wrong one. Here we are. Hi there, Twitch. Um, I've got my uh, I've got my chat feed open in uh, on my phone for for Twitch, so I can maybe see. A bit more than I usually do. Um, I think you can follow me on Twitch, can't you? And you can... I don't think you can sub because I'm a million miles from being a partner or whatever it's called in Twitch. Uh, now, let me tell you what's happening today. I've decided to try something different. And this is really for you, Twitch people, because I know streams on Twitch are usually much longer than just a show. So what, I, what we're going to do... If you want to, we're going to hang out for um, for a number, uh, a, a number, a number of hours. I'll have to make my dinner in between, but that's the good thing about running these long interviews is that I can go and if you want to ask me something or whatever, you just do the comments, the chat. Um, so first today, Millie Formby. Now, if you haven't heard about Millie, Millie did some crowdfunding so that she could fly her ultralight, uh, ultralight, no, microlight, microlight, and there, there, that's Millie in action. And she flew around the continent of Australia. Just one little bit she didn't get around because it was a bit dangerous and there was no air traffic control and, and, um, but she's going to tell us about that in this conversation. I spoke with Millie in July before she um, before she got going. She crowdfunded and raised, smashed the the um, uh, the target, and she took off from the northwest of Western Australia and has gone right the way around the country. Now it wasn't a non-stop flight or anything like that. It wasn't set up for that. But the distance was roughly equivalent to the distance that the shorebirds that breed in Siberia and uh, North Korea, Japan, but mostly um, Eastern Russia, they breed up there, but then they migrate down to Australia and a lot of them go up near the Kimberley and um, around Broome. But lots of them end up the southern parts of Australia, especially like the Curlews, and in New Zealand. And some of them even go, um, you know, around, further around into the Great Australian Bight, and some of them go out into the um, other parts of the Pacific. But <clears throat> that distance that Millie covered was about the distance that the shore, those migrating shorebirds uh, take. But she was stopping off at primary schools and doing community meetings in towns around the way, <clears throat> so that um, so that she can spread awareness. Because as we often say in these shows, uh, there's an awful lot of birds that people are just not aware of, and migratory shorebirds are astounding. And look, if there's some in uh, interest in it, I've done. Uh, three, three or four episodes about the uh, curlews. Um, we've done a lot about migratory birds, and uh, I I have done uh, a feature on World Migratory Bird Day, fe featuring the cuckoos and the um, swifts that migrate from China to Europe and back. So from Beijing into Europe and then back. So that's um, 
So that's that. So let's um, uh, let's get going. Oh, if you don't know, I'm Grant. I host. The, this all started as a podcast, but um, even though the podcast is going fantastic, and if you're not, if you're not getting the podcast, um, gra- you can. Uh, but because you're here, I assume you really like the live stream. So I like streaming. I really enjoy streaming. Uh, and I like that I can interact and answer questions and also that I can resurface a lot of the conversations that m- might be two or three years old, but the but the plight of the birds is still the same. Um, and everyone's on holidays in Australia at the moment, so there's basically hardly anyone I'm going to be talking to live for the first half of January. So... Here's a good way to keep uh, keep things going. Uh, after Millie, I'm going to play the conversation I had with Professor Daryl James uh, Jones, who you may know as an author. Um, you'll see in all the bookstores a book called "The Birds at My Table," and the publishers did him dirty. The first edition, even though it's a, a book about his feeding table in Brisbane, the cover was done by an artist. The publisher got an artist from uh, the US, I think, to do the cover. And they're all birds that no one in Australia knows. Um, But the second edition, which was in the thumbnail, the cover for this stream, did have a pink cockatoo on it. Not that pink cockatoos have been at his uh, feeding table in Brisbane. So anyway, uh, Daryl's now based in Kuala Lumpur. His wife got a job there. Daryl's still a lecturer, a professor, uh, doing all of his stuff online from Kuala Lumpur into Griffith University in Brisbane. So uh, so Daryl and I talked about his studies of Tarasian crows, which are the 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 common version of the corvids that live around Brisbane. And we pose all the questions about crows are really smart and are crows that live in cities becoming significantly different to crows that live in, you know, wooded environments or, you know, the farmlands and open woodlands where they would have once been found. Following that, uh, so we'll, that'll be a, we'll be going. Um, I'm playing an interview that I did with a podcaster, and that was why I reached out to him. He has a podcast uh, called The Avian Rebbe. Uh, the fellow's name is Eric Eisenstein. He's a businessman from. Uh, let me remember. I think he was from it's from the southwest in in the states. I want to say Texas, but I think it might be New Mexico or Nevada. But we'll we'll find out as we go through. And he really had, I mean, before the pandemic and the lockdowns, he'd look out the window and he'd say, birds, brown birds, pretty coloured birds, little birds, big birds. But during the pandemic and the uh, with him not being able to do his normal uh, things, and he's a lay. He's he's not a um, orthodox ra- rabbi. He's a lay rabbi. I think he explains the difference in the conversation. But he started taking his camera out and taking pictures of birds, and he got to know the birds and he got to love the birds, but in a different way than I do because I'm really into the ecology and. He felt a real spiritual connection with birds and then with nature. Um, so it, it, that's a cool conversation that, that we had. I, I think I really enjoyed it. So, um, look, you know I always want to know where you're from, so tell me that. Um, especially Twitch, I want to get to know you you, you lot because... Uh, I'm I'm guessing I probably know the Facebook crew. I don't know who's 
uh, YouTube, but hopefully you'll tell me as we get going. Uh, can I run an ad? Can I run a bit of an ad? Hey, I don't have a job like all of my um, interviewees. Hi, Naomi. <laughs> Thanks for that uh, bit of Facebook love there. Uh, so, 1st of January, streaming bill, hosting bill, all that stuff comes in. So, hey, if you've... Um, if you didn't spend all of your money over uh, the Christmas period and whatnot, you know, buy me a coffee if you if you like. Uh, I'm setting up Patreon and all that. Um, but just taking a little while to get all the artwork and everything ready for that and do the little videos, introductory videos. So, yeah, but in the meantime, there we go. Um, would you like me just to get into it now? How about we do that? Um... So I will be here, but if you see me, if you see me get up and go, I'm making a coffee or um, putting my putting my dinner on to warm up or something, and I can see the comments, uh, so I will um, attend to them. And um, yeah, okay. As uh, as the B fifty two said in Rock Lobster. Let's rock! Come on, Millie. Here we go. Oh. Good morning, bird nerds. Good afternoon, bird nerds, if you're not watching live. Good evening, bird nerds, if you're staying up late. I'm Grant Williams. This is The Bird Emergency, the show where I get to talk to amazing bird people. And today, it's somebody who's about to embark on a pretty epic journey. 20,000 kilometres in a microlight uh, following the coastline of Australia. Um, what was her? I'll introduce you now, Millie. Mil <laughs> Amelia Formby, who is uh, the Shellbirds Project Officer at BirdLife Australia and a zoologist and, and uh, an adventurer you've got on your, uh, uh, on your, on your bio.
Bird nerds, good afternoon bird nerds if you're not watching live. Good evening bird nerds if you're staying up late. I'm Grant Williams, this is The Bird Emergency, the show where I get to talk to amazing bird people and today it's somebody who's about to... I can't believe I just explained to you what was going on and I had it on mute again. Um, sorry. So anyway, we're, we're right now, right? We embark on a pretty epic journey 20,000 kilometers in a microlight uh, following the coastline of Australia um, what was it I'll introduce you now Millie Mil <laughs> <laughs> Amelia Formby who is uh, the shellbirds project officer at BirdLife Australia and a zoologist and and uh, an adventurer you've got on your uh, uh, on your on your bio on your on your website millie you must be a little bit crazy too welcome well, to the bird emergency how are you thanks grant thanks for having me I'm, I'm doing very well thank you now now the reason millie's talking to me is not just because we want to talk about shorebirds because um every day should be shorebird day exactly. um, but millie's about to fly uh, a micro light not an ultra light we've got to talk about mm -hmm. the distinctions yep. around the coast of australia basically to highlight the amazing migratory journeys that shorebirds undertake. And, of course, talked about lots of shorebirds. We're big curlew fans on the bird mm -hmm. emergency. Yeah, really? Nice. How, for, first, I, I have to ask you, where, where did this idea come from? <laughs> yeah, um, that's a bit of a story. Hey, uh, so I started working in shorebird conservation about 2014. So Is Millie loud enough? Let me know. Studies group and so I've been banding and flagging shorebirds for quite a while. And then I moved over to Perth to start a new job at the University of WA over there in the animal biology department. And um, one of the other technicians there was telling me how his brother flew microlites and how they wanted to fly around Australia together and raise money for Royal Flying Doctor Service. And um, I guess something a seed was planted in my mind I guess and the next day I was driving um to Bunnings for work and this idea just hit me like a bolt out of the blue when I stopped at the traffic lights that I could learn to fly a micro light and follow the shorebirds on my on migration to Siberia so I think somewhere in my subconscious you know the two shorebirds and this micro light idea kind of got squished together and popped out like that and um yeah <laughs> Had, had you always had had a fascination with shorebirds, with with no, the journeys yeah. that they undertake? And when when did you first become aware of the yeah. of, of these really small? Most of them are small, um, very 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 insignificant looking birds to the general <laughs> public. When did you become aware that they were just these titans mm. of the air? Yeah, yeah, they are titans, aren't they? Uh, well, I actually got, I actually learned about them from a fellow artist. So before I got into science and zoology, I did a visual arts degree at Monash and I majored in tapestry of all things. And I became a tapestry weaver for seven years at the Australian Tapestry Workshop in South Melbourne. And um, I was working on a tapestry with uh, John Wolseley, who's uh, a really well-known Australian artist, and he, he does a lot of beautiful uh, watercolours of swamps and wetlands, and uh, they often feature a lot of birds as well. And he'd just done a mural in Melbourne uh, uh, about shorebirds, and um, I think it was called uh, oh, it was Swamps and Cries of Wetland Birds or something like that. I can't remember the title. Anyway, there was an unveiling of the mural in, in the city and um, I learned about all these knots and godwits and stints that were in the mural uh, and I'd never heard of them before. And um, Penny Johns from Victorian Waiter Studies Group was there giving a talk about the shorebirds and talking about John and I was just blown away and that's when I got into helping out with the Victorian Waiter Studies Group. So I probably saw that mural like 2012 or something like that but that was the first time i'd ever heard of um shorebird migration yeah and how how did the the idea form in your head that you you wanted to fly 
a, a an approximately uh, similar distance to mm. um what was it the adventure the adventure part of it that that popped up first or is it the educational and awareness raising part that um, really really got you going yeah it was definitely the awareness raising aspect of it so working in shore bird conservation it became really apparent to me that uh, one of the biggest difficulties to overcome with these birds is uh, actually getting the word out there that they that they exist in the first place most people don't know what shorebirds are and it's really common to, for people to mix shorebirds up with seabirds so they'll go oh I've heard about mutton birds and they think that mutton birds are, and shorebirds are the same thing because mutton bird migration is very uh, it's often talked about because people see them washed up on the beach a lot and um, uh, so it just Getting, getting the word out there that the two groups are distinctive and, and showing people about shorebird migration and how epic it is, um, it, it's a real challenge to be able to do that. And I, when I came up with this idea, like it really was a bolt out of the blue, it just hit me and it kind of shocked me, it shook me to my core, you know, but it went, oh my goodness, I can actually do this if I decide to do it. And it took me many months before I actually did anything about it. But I was thinking, I reckon a female pilot getting out there and flying doing this epic adventure would probably bring a lot of attention to to the birds themselves yeah well that that's almost um uh, self-evident nowadays yeah. because you know that uh, since the movie fly away home i mean yes. i i'm just going on a faulty uh, a, an old man's faulty memory here but but i think that was an oscar-winning movie um it certainly launched the the acting career of mm -hmm. of uh, that was Anna Paquin, wasn't it? Yeah, who Anna who Paquin. was in that? So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. it it certainly got the potential to to draw a lot of attention, and th and this week you've been getting a lot of yeah. attention, which oh, has been so terrific, because <laughs> because this week is special because it's the launch, the delayed launch, and we'll talk about yeah. why it was delayed a little bit yeah. of the wing threads project which it is great and i want you to tell everyone why it's great and what the project actually is millie okay <laughs> so the project is called wing threads flight around eyes and uh, as you mentioned earlier on i'm planning to fly my microlight all the way around australia uh, along the coastline and the plan is to stop at schools and libraries along the way and share my new children's book, which is called A Shorebird Flying Adventure, with students and teachers in schools and libraries all around the coast. And the book, A Shorebird Flying Adventure, was commissioned by CSIRO Publishing in 2019 after they heard me give a talk at the AOC in Darwin. And uh, they came up to me afterwards and said, would you like to do a kid's book? We'd like to have more female role models in STEM. And that was just a no-brainer for me. And I was thinking earlier, actually, it's it's perfect that we're having um, this chat today because it's International Day of Women and Girls in Science and um, the Shorebird Flying Adventure book is all about, you know, having female role models in STEM. And um, the the book, uh, in the book, Microlight Millie is the main character and she takes the reader on a journey through the East Asian Australasian Flyway and... Uh, it shows why how, how amazing uh, and awesome migratory shorebirds are and, they are and they learn all about their behavioural ecology. Something that seems a, a, a bit of a disconnect for me as someone who's outside of the actual community of um, science educators and and bird people is when, when when I look at all the names of the people who are active promoting the work, um, being engaged in in all of the engagement activities, so many of the leaders t seem to me to be women, Millie. So it's oh. <laughs> so well well it, just have a look at the the people that are, that I've talked to on the show, and I I do something mm -hmm. regular with 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 Holly at. at from bird yeah, life we've yeah. got claire greenwell we've got tegan mm -hmm. we've, yeah, we've got you yesterday i talked to um kylie Sones. i talked to kate Ra kate ravage sally mm -hmm. bryant i mean the the leaders seem to be um 
equally, if not more, women in in the communication mm. space. And God, I hate saying that word. You know, <laughs> they're just activities that people are doing. Um, yeah. Is is it still a, a a massive wall that needs to be belted down that that women are mm-hmm. not getting a fair go still in science, technology, engineering, mathematics education? Yeah, um, I definitely think women have bigger hurdles to climb in that sphere, and obviously women have um, different challenges to face as well when it comes to having science careers because. Uh, Women have that choice whether or not to have children and then whether or not to stay home and look after their children. And and that has a big impact when you're working in a science career, especially if you're in academia or some kind of research field. Uh, I know that uh, I've got a lot of friends who've um, had career setbacks for making that choice. My sister's one of them as well. She's an immunologist. And... um, it, yeah, I think there needs to be more things in, in place to help women navigate those particular um, uh, times in, in their life, you know, those uh, moments in your life that you have to navigate as a, as a scientist. And uh, there's only 28% of women employed in STEM fields in Australia as of last year, going by the statistics. And research shows that the best way to get girls into STEM careers is to have positive role models of them. So I think it's absolutely vital that, yeah, we, we're out there and um, uh, showing showing girls what, what can be done, yeah. Well, if that's a, uh, an average that, that can be drawn across all of the sort of science fields uh, nationally, it's going to mm. vary internationally. But if we're talking about Australia, mm. that means there are, some really extraordinary people working in in bird world uh, in Australia <laughs> because they're the ones that are are visible and that are talking beyond the community and that's what I really appreciate about about all of you. Now I I want to know how much guts does it take to oh. get in and get in a a, a, a micro light and. Um, is is that is that a separate passion like flying or is it a means to an end for you oh no it's very much a passion but i i um didn't get into flying until i came up with this project so i never went oh i want to be a pilot when i grow up or anything like that i i didn't know any pilots i never considered it until i talked to my mate about flying them so when i came up with this idea like I think that idea hit me at like the beginning of 2015 and I um, didn't actually do a trial instructional flight in a microlight until later that year in November. And I, I went, oh, I better see if I actually like flying, you know, if I want to have a So I um, went and had, yeah, it's called a tip for trial instructional flight. I went and did that with um, Gordon Marshall out at Sky Sports Flying School, which is about 200 kilometres east of Perth out in the wheat belt. And, and I just fell in love with it. I just went, this is my jam. Like, I love this. Sick. It's awesome. Um, <laughs> I thought it was the best thing ever. And I was like, oh, my God, I can't believe, you know, that I could do this. I found it to be a really empowering thing. And then I got the money together to pay for lessons and started started doing it regularly from April the following year. Now, most people would understand that um, flying is like horse riding and sailing. Uh, Insanely expensive to have as a hobby. So I think think they're the three things that weld weld those disparate activities together. Um, This is true. So... (laughs) How how long has it taken you to be able to turn flying around Australia into a reality? Because it's it Ooh. must have involved piles of extra money, apart from just <laughs> living. But the planning aspect of it must have been huge. And then, of course, the C word intervened, mm-hmm. and and you're a very clumsy. 
person. Oh. So I didn't look at it because, because I've seen so many pictures of you with plaster that also uh, yeah. put a bit of a, 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 a stop on it. So, yeah. so, so you're learning how to fly in 2015. You, you, you decide this is amazing. Let's go through the timeline. What, yeah. what, what happened next? Yeah, okay. So it's interesting that you bring up the finances because I, I I've been very fortunate to do several things that have allowed me to do this. And I, and I... I'll just apologise there too. Because when I did this interview, I wasn't streaming. Um, so I didn't have all the overlays and everything uh, prepared to run through. But these days when I do an interview... A, a new interview I um, will have a whole lot of visuals so that it's not just two talking heads uh, on the on the screen or three talking heads or four talking heads um, so yeah just bear that in mind as we as we go through Millie's more than entertaining enough but uh, I had before I, I'd spoken to her there were pictures of her with broken broken arm in the sling uh, in 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 a hospital with, I think, broken leg or broken femur or something. So, um, yeah, she's uh, she's had a few accidents. Not all, not all from flying. That was the thing. I think it's one of those things when <laughs> stuff's supposed to happen. It's, it's you know things fall into place to help you achieve it. And um, you know when I, I didn't I didn't actually start learning to fly until I was like a year later after I had that idea because. I just moved to Perth after a marriage breakup. I didn't have, I started a new job. I didn't even own a car at the time, let alone enough money to start paying for flying. So, you know, I had to get myself together that way and get a car and things like that. And then um, I applied for a flying scholarship. I got an Amelia Earhart Fly Now scholarship through the 99th International Organization of Women Pilots. And that was worth $6,000 US. And that covered my flight lessons as well as my passenger and cross-country endorsements so it took me about a year to go solo and get my pilot certificate so I've got that in 2017 and the endorsements by the end of 2017 and then um, I, I moved over to uh, Lake Macquarie in oh hey Costa how are you doing isn't, <laughs> isn't that <laughs> Uh, Costa, we were just talking about you before we pressed the live button. Good on you. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I moved over to Newcastle to work with the guys who make the aircraft, uh, Airborne Australia, and um, they ended up sponsoring me and allowed me to... So I moved over... I, I sold all my stuff in Perth, and so everything I own now just fits in my car, and I moved over to Lake Macquarie, and I worked for six months in the airborne factory helping to assemble and service microlights. And those guys let me fly their aircraft for free for six months while I built up my flowing, uh, flowing? flying hours. And um, uh, during that time, I managed to uh, get the money together from sponsorship. And I also ran a crowdfunding campaign in 2017 that raised $18,000. The Harvey Catchment Council sponsored me. An anonymous donor gave me a large sum of money. And Dick Smith chipped some in as well. And it was enough for me to uh, start, uh, get my own microlight aircraft, which I was able to help build myself with the guys at Airborne. And they let me use my hours working in the factory as credit to the, towards the plane. And they did the plane for me at cost as well. So um, that was massive, like to, to have all of those opportunities. And uh, the other way I've saved money to get me flying is by house sitting. So when I moved over to Newcastle, I started house sitting. So I haven't paid rent for four years because I've been house sitting. Um, but I also had the guys at Airborne. They, um, one of the guys there, Phil, <laughs> had a caravan. So when I was in between house sits, I'd live in the caravan <laughs> and park outside the factory. So I, I really have just, um, what do you call it? Just bootlegged, I've bootlegged the project. I've done whatever I could to not pay rent so that I can pay for flying lessons. That's been my priority. Well, you're obviously very very adaptable. You're obviously <laughs> yeah. a good networker, Millie. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, look, off the, off the topic totally, but what's it like being like a permanent house sitter? How... Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
I, I've been so fortunate. Uh, I've made a lot of friends. Uh, the place I'm staying in now that I'm live streaming to you from is a house sit that I've spent most of my time in and the owners here spend half of their time over in Turkey. And I was so fortunate during the pandemic. They actually got stuck in Turkey during the pandemic. So I was living here for, you know, 10 months. Um, so I'm here for months at a time. And um, what's it like house sitting? You make a lot of friends. Um, you get used to uncertainty and you have a lot of plan Bs. So <laughs> my plan Bs were like, um, if I didn't have a house sit, I could always go and stay at the airport in the pilot's quarters because I was friends with the guys in the terminal who work for Skydive Australia and stuff and Airborne. Or I could just swag it <laughs> if I really got stuck. Um I've only had to stay at a hostel once, but you know, you make friends, they let you crash on their couch. It's, you know, you, you, you get by. Yep. You have, <laughs> you, you have to be adaptable, don't you? Um, you, you have tell, to be adaptable. tell me about the process of crowdfunding for, for mm -hmm. such a large um, undertaking and, mm -hmm. uh, and the process of, of producing the book. I mean, CSIRO mm -hmm. have, have, um, committed to produce the book so yeah. tell us about the skills that you have to bring on board after being a a, a textile artist and then a zoologist mm -hmm. you you're bringing so many different life skills together um to to then be an artist and a financier how uh, sorry an author and a financier <laughs> so how um how did the process of of a agreeing to the contract because they've they've sought you out that was fortuitous yeah um but all the all the sort of business stuff and then crowdfunding getting the money taxation implications all that kind of stuff that i think scientists and conservationists are going to have to investigate a bit more often as as regular sources of funding are harder to get how hmm. what have you learned what did you do tell us how that all happened well, just make it up as you go along, ask lots of questions. <laughs> um, that's pretty much been my way to go. I, I spend a lot of time asking people who've done it before what they did. And um, uh, especially with the first crowdfunding campaign I ran in 2017, uh, I was trying to get together $70,000 for a microlight and we only got eighteen and a half thousand dollars but when i think about it like that was such a massive achievement because uh i hadn't i didn't even have my pilot license by that point then. <laughs> <laughs> i was just saying i'm gonna fly to siberia i'm not even a qualified pilot yet i mean for people to invest in that idea before i've even got the skills was pretty massive so i think that speaks a lot to the idea but before I ran the campaign, I spoke to a lot of people like you and Richie, um, who, who had success with um, crowdfunding, and Matt Heron with the Bittens in Rice project, and, and others who've done it before, and they gave me a lot of tips. So that was fantastic. And and I, I worked with the team from Remember the Wild. So a lot of the people from Remember the Wild, uh, we did our masters together at Melbourne Uni in zoology. So having them on board, really helped me to do all the media and social media and um, just running the campaign and, and learning as you go what you've got to do to get yourself out there has really informed this current campaign that I'm running now and uh, I think I've been a lot more prepared and um, uh, a, a lot more net I've got a lot more connections in my network nowadays than what I did back then as well. I'll just editorialise for a minute because I haven't met Catherine from uh, uh, Remember the Wild or, or, yeah, or Ewan. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I haven't met Ewan, but uh, yeah. their public presence on social yeah. media seems to be incredibly supportive of of everyone else that's working in the field. And that's yeah. one of the great delights of doing a show like this is that mm. um, it's it's not competitive it's it's really supportive and the outcomes are what everybody is concerned about um yeah so it it's really good that they've helped you step along mm -hmm. but yeah, the, sure. <laughs> the crowd the crowdfunding mm -hmm. how did you just sort of decide one day oh well i'll crowdfund it and then you mm -hmm. went online and thought crowdfunding platforms and looked for a platform like no, because i'm sure a lot of people 
Oh. Oh, you've frozen there, Grant. Oh, so I'm still here. Is that me or you? I think no, that that was me, Millie. Oh, there back. we go. You're back. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, we, yeah. I think I think something happened at my at, at my internet end. Did you did you hear that that question? You were asking about how I chose the platform. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Did did you just wake up one morning and go? Yeah, crowdfunding. That's what I'm going to do. And then you just went online and went, right, crowdfunding. Is it GoFundMe? I've heard about that. I've heard about Kickstarter. How, how did that all come about? Yeah, so, um, well, I was working at UWA at the time and um, I'd seen several other conservation projects have success with crowdfunding and I thought that was going to be my best option to get money in. I also applied for many, many grants and things like that and I've had success with some and not with others. Um but grant writing is not my forte and it's very, very hard and very, very competitive. And um, so I, I thought crowdfunding was probably the, the better way to, um, <laughs> because this is written for 800 crowdfund. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Um, but I was working at UWA and they had, they were using Chuck as their crowdfunding platform. So they offered to uh, host my crowdfunding campaign so I could offer uh, tax deductible donations. So because I was an I might just bring that back and take myself out of the screen so you can see what that uh, what that was on on the screen there. There it is. Hang on. So I, I thought crowdfunding was probably the, the better way to, um, <laughs> because this is written for 800 crowdfund. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Um, but I was working at UWA and they had, they were using Chuck's as their crowdfunding platform. So they offered to uh, host my crowdfunding campaign so I could offer uh, tax deductible donations. So because I was an employee there, they helped me out. Uh, and because I'd used stuff before, I was familiar with it. I went with it again this time. So, yeah, yeah that's a, that's an issue for anyone who's raising money, crowdfunding, or or, yeah. or as as I'm dealing with with the uh, with the bird nerd trivia, that money that uh, there's no tax paid on it, and just because someone's donating to a good cause, it doesn't mean that it's tax free or anything like that. So seek some advice, I would say. Oh, no, I did have done that. I've spoken to, um, yeah, accountants and uh, done all my research there as well because absolutely you don't want someone to come along and say, oh, actually, we're going to take half of that yeah. <laughs> or whatever. Now, um, the difference between an ultralight and a microlight, tell, yeah. me, tell me what's special about what you'll be flying. All right. So a microlight is a powered hang glider. It's uh, two-axis aircraft. So most people are familiar with three-axis aircraft. So you've got three, oh, can I get my hand here? Three axes, you've got pitch, which is up and down. You've got roll, which is side to side, and then you've got yaw, which is twist. And um, microlights, you, you don't have rudder pedals, so you can't control that twisting yaw action in the aircraft, whereas all other three-axis aircraft do. So um, in the microlight, you are not using a stick and rudder to control. You are actually holding onto a triangular control frame that's attached to the wing above you, and you are, it's called a weight shift aircraft. So to turn the aircraft, you actually have to push physically push the control bar left and right or forward and back um, to, to change pitch and roll. And the, and the controls are actually opposite to a three-axis aircraft. So if you want to go faster... You push the, um, you pull the bar in, and that will bring the aircraft nose down. So you put it pulling on airspeed, you go quicker, and you'll also start to descend if you don't have enough power on. And to go slower, you push the bar out, and that'll bring the nose up and pull it down. So it's the opposite controls to the, um, yeah, the axis. Um, do you graduate from from one to another? Like, is do you step through, or have you have you started? in pretty much in the same kind of uh, aer aerobatic machine that you have <laughs> built yourself? Okay. Um, 
I started in microlights and uh, not everybody learns to fly both. I've learned to fly both because I wanted to get a controlled airspace endorsement and so I can fly in controlled airspace because there's two streams of aviation in Australia. There's recreational aviation and then there's general aviation. And you can't fly in controlled airspace in the recreational aviation stream. You need to have a GA pilot license. So there's a recreational pilot certificate in RA and a recreational pilot license in GA. It's very confusing and annoying because it's um, CASA. Um, <laughs> so I had to go and learn to fly a three-axis aircraft and get a recreational pilot license or an RPL so I could then go and get a controlled airspace endorsement. And once you have that controlled airspace endorsement, you can use it in any aircraft you want to, including a microlight. You just can't go and get one and do the training in a microlight. Okay, so, <laughs> so to decode that, you had to learn learn how to fly to get a general yeah. aviation air li uh, uh, license in, for instance, a Cessna. Yeah, so you, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so you had to learn how to how to fly the typical light plane yeah. in and and GA means that you can go and use an airport like Essendon or Mordialic yep. or something like that. Whereas yeah. a recreational one means means you have to go to the cliff. Right, but you can't go into busy airspace. You can only uh, you can only you can go like um you have controlled and uncontrolled aerodromes. So controlled aerodromes have air traffic control, and they're classified into two groups. So you have Class D and Class C airspace. So Class C is all the really big ones like Melbourne and Sydney and Canberra, and then you've got Class D, which are the smaller ones like Essendon and Avalon and that. So you have to have controlled airspace if there's air traffic control. But at uncontrolled aerodromes, air traffic control might not be there. It is still hella busy. And, and you've got to rely on talk, talking to all the other pilots and the pilots doing correct radio calls and communicating with one another so that, you know, you all know what you're doing. Um, so, yeah, it's, well, it doesn't mean well, you landed on the cliff. <laughs> <laughs> well, but bird nerds, I never... I, I never, I never expected that you'd be hearing that on the bird emergency <laughs> so, yeah yeah I'm giving you eight yeah. <laughs> Millie, how, um how hard was it or is it to have mm -hmm. planned out all of the visits that you're going to make uh at schools and and i'm guessing that you're going to be doing community events and whatnot along yeah. the way and yeah. and following on from that can can the general public turn up or do they have to be school kids Oh, well, I'm, um, the, I'll start with the planning bit first. <laughs> so uh, the microlight, I, I planned it based on, you know, the microlight's capabilities as an aircraft, I guess. So it's got an endurance of about five hours. And um, uh, so most of the flights that I'm doing are between 100 and um, 300 nautical miles. So one to three hours of flying at a time. And uh, I'm trying to maximise as many stopping at as many places as I possibly can on the way. So there's 90 stops around the country. Uh, I, I can only do a rough plan at this stage of where I'm going to stop over because you can't do all the nitty-gritty planning without all of your, um, you know, your forecasts and stuff like that. Uh, so, yeah, I'll, it'll just be as I go. You, you have to plan all that stuff much closer to the date. So it's a rough plan. Um, and, yeah, uh, with the schools and library stuff, um, I'll be setting up an application on my website for schools at the end of the crowdfunding campaign once once I'm sure I've got all the money so schools can apply if they want me to come to their school and do a visit. And we're planning to do like a reading of the book and an activity, a book-related activity with, with, to do with shorebirds as well. I was actually thinking about possibly getting um, the kids to make their own fold-up books as um uh, online activity, oh, they, they came up with it in COVID where they were getting kids to make these fold-up books. And John Walsley did one too. There's a YouTube video of him making one and they're all, all about nature and stuff. So I was thinking of doing something like that, but with shorebirds. Yeah. How many schools are, are you hoping to visit? In, mm, in, yeah. in the 20,000 in the coast. So obviously they're going to be uh, schools around the coast. Yeah. So... Have, have you got have you got an idea in mind of how many you'll be popping in? 
to see? Yeah, well, I think, uh, you know, if I'm at a, a stopover for, you know, maybe three three days or whatever, I think it's realistic to visit, you know, one or two schools in a day without, you know, wiping myself out <laughs> and giving enough time for planning and all of that. So hopefully, uh, yeah, we can, we can visit maybe... Um, you know, two, three, four schools at each stopover, if not a few more. So you you mentioned about five hours is the um is the flying time the uh, what do you mm -hmm. call it up time is there a groovy is, endurance is, is endurance, yeah. at, endurance okay so okay. so yeah. about five hours endurance uh, yeah. I'm guessing that's on a fair weather flying day. Um, yeah. How how far do you cover in about five hours? Yeah, so it really depends on the wind. So the aircraft burns about 10 litres of fuel an hour in that five hours. And uh, if my aircraft does about 55, 60 knots, so an average of about 100 k's an hour. So if I've got a headwind, I will not be doing quite that fast. <laughs> so I won't get as far, but if I've got a tailwind, I'll be going a bit faster. So um, it really depends. But I'd say on average about four to 500 k's off the full tank of fuel. And... Which way are you going? You're starting off in Broome. So um, are you heading to Perth or are you heading to Darwin in in the first instance? Yeah, I'll be going anti-clockwise around the country and that's because the prevailing winds will be in my favour that way. <laughs> so yeah. yeah. So after a week, where do you expect to be after leaving uh, Broome? I can't tell you because it will all depend on the weather. Yeah. <laughs> and and look, every true adventurer has to have a ground crew, um, yeah. getting getting your dinner ready and yeah. taking the uh, taking takeoff and landing shots or recovering yeah. you from I don't know a, 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 a mangrove infested um, oh, yeah. cro crocodile <laughs> crocodile field location. That'll all make for good TV, Millie, down the track. Who's in your ground crew? How many people? What, what's the what's the wing threads operation in terms of personnel? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I've got a few friends who put their hands up for ground crew so far. So uh, my friends Jamie and Bass, they've done their own sailing adventure down the west coast of Australia years ago called the Salty Voyage, and um, they were collecting water samples to measure plastic pollution in oh, wow. the Indian Ocean over there, which is incredible. So they'll be joining me for part of it. Uh, I've also got other another a fellow pilot, um, his name's Trevor, he'll be joining me for part of it as well. Um, and another guy, Robin, he's a paragliding pilot and his wife want to join me for part of it. Uh, so I, I'm really relying on volunteers. I was hoping Remember the Wild could join me because um, we want to do a documentary film about the adventure, uh, but they're um, not in a position to be able to do that anymore, unfortunately, because... Um, so we're hoping we get the funding together and, and then they can get somebody to come along with me because that was the original plan, having a member of Remember the Wild join me on the ground crew. Um, but, yeah, if people out there would like to come and join me for an adventure or part of <laughs> and you want to be on a ground crew, hit me up. And, and let's put it out there. Hey, GoPro or DJI, DJI or anyone else, I'm sure Millie could do with a few extra um, oh, Ca cameras to to get some some great airborne shots and maybe yeah. um, so you know it's it's not too late to to contribute now that the crowdfunding kicked off this week uh, yeah. really so how uh, are you are you watching it hour by oh hour God. am I watching it am I... <laughs> it's hard not to like check it every five minutes um, last uh, yesterday morning we hit. 25% of our target in four days. So that was insane. So, so um, what's the target? The target is $75,000 and we got to um, $18,750 yesterday morning. And as of last night, uh, we were we hit 20000 and I think we're up to about twenty one this morning. So that just keeps ticking along, which is incredible. And um, in large part because of... Uh, the wonderful Costa, who's joining us at the moment. I, um, Costa and I did a live stream on Monday night on the launch day of the campaign and we talked about shorebirds and, and wing threads flying around Oz and 
I invited Costa to come flying with me, which was pretty incredible. <laughs> and he said yes. So that was amazing. And um, we did that flight together yesterday morning and we streamed it, live streamed it to Facebook Live. And I took Costa for a fly out over the Hunter Wetlands here around Newcastle and down the coast. And we had a wonderful chat about shorebirds and, you know, all the work bird life is doing. And, um, yeah, showed Costa the sights. And it was just it was just awesome. We've had such a good response. Well, it, it, it's good. We, it, good on you, Costa. <laughs> you're, you're in the peanut gallery today, so that's great. <laughs> He's still buzzing, he says. For, for people who are just listening, uh, Costa's in the comments, which is terrific. And... Um, and and one of my one of my favourite friends of the show, there's yeah, Claire Greenwell, has just me. just commented. Such an inspiring story, <laughs> Millie. It's great to see so much community support mm. behind this exciting project. It's definitely a win for the birds. Too right, Claire. Absolutely, mm. it is. Um, yeah. Claire's done her own inspiring journey she recently has. too. Um, but you've got a donate button on on it's Wing it. Threads. Um, yeah. So I encourage you to click that. That will take you to chuffed.org and um, you'll find Millie there, uh, slash project, slash a shorebird flying adventure. So I'm sure on Chuffed, if you were to search shorebird flying adventure, you would yeah. easily find Millie. Um, please, please donate. Uh, 20,950 is, yeah. I've just... I've just had a look. So there is 27 days still to go. I'm pretty confident you'll you'll reach that target, Millie. I think that's... I think so. um, I think it's uh, that's we actually that's... had a fundraiser last night that raised $2,000. So that hasn't gone in there yet. So um, we're very close to getting to 30%. I think we'll be uh, almost a third of the way there by the end of the week, I hope. That would be amazing. Well, we might talk yeah. about this... Uh, uh, off uh, off air but the whole idea of bird uh, bird nerd trivia is to raise awareness and money for uh, mm -hmm. s sort of small projects so we might we might talk about whether we can do something with that too um i'll i'll just um let you know what bird nerd trivia is or was i was running trivia questions uh trivia games on a platform that was designed to help raise funds for um, charities and small groups that can't get normal access to, to funding and aren't big enough to get those big commercial trivia nights and whatnot. But um, with some changes for the hosting and the development of that, it's down at the moment. So... Um, I put together. It was we we're getting close to about two hundred and fifty original uh, trivia questions that I'd drawn from the podcast episodes and other things that I'd learned. Not all those stupid, you know, how much does an ostrich egg weigh and all that. No, it was really original bird trivia that no one else could do. But it's in hiatus. Uh, I I want to bring it back um, as soon as. Ian, the developer, has worked out what he's going to do with the uh, how the new how the platform's going to be relaunched. So then I'll get into it. Otherwise, I'll have to use one of the other uh, other ones. Which um, yeah, it makes it they're very costly to do them well. And yeah, I mean, I don't have I can't do costly, <laughs> so. That, that that kind of makes it easy to get uh, people from from other other parts of the world to get to know what's going yeah, on. Awesome. Um, here we are. I'm, I've got we've got some more comments. Which um, for audio listeners, you you're going to have to bear with us. If you don't know who Costa is, Costa is the host of Gardening Australia, which is the premier longest running um, gardening program in in Australia. Um, produced on our national broadcaster, the ABC. And um, Costa is big into community uh, involvement. Uh, Millie, I'm surprised that you didn't try and land on his nature strip. That would have been, <laughs> that would have been good TV. Um, 
but yeah, Costa's cost us into um sharing his community now look we're getting the we're getting the comments coming in which is what we like do you want to read that one out really oh it says, it's annie hi annie thank you for joining us annie joined us yesterday too for the live stream uh hi million grant i love your dedication millie school children and adults alike are so privileged to have you as our role model the flight with costa was so exciting and fun thank you annie <laughs> um yeah <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I, sorry for giggling. Uh, I, I saw this one before you did. I think a verge adventure with Millie. Yes, uh, quite good on you, Costa. Um, look, there's quite a few people um, watching us, watching along. So if you've got a question, I guess it's a good uh, opportunity yeah, to get one, please. get one in there for Millie. Uh, Millie, you. you you're a country kid. You grew up yeah. in, in in Druin in Gippsland yeah. in mm -hmm. uh, in Victoria. Yeah. I I want to know how you got from artistry to zoology. Can you uh, yeah, can, uh, can you take us through that? Yeah, sure. Um, well, as a kid, I always loved animals, and I can remember asking my sister when I was seven, "What what?" Do you call someone who studies animals? And she said a zoologist. And I was like, well, I want to be a zoologist when I grow up. And um, I loved drawing as well as a kid. And the only thing I ever wanted to draw was animals. I only liked drawing animals. Um, so I guess the two things were always there from a young age. Uh, but I got into science later. I... I, I got into the art stuff first. I wanted to be an animator when I was in high school and I did animation and then I did, I started doing an illustration course at TAFE and uh, then I did the Bachelor of Visual Arts and majored in tapestry, as I mentioned before. But when I was working as a tapestry weaver, I actually got a repetitive strain injury in my shoulder and I went, oh, well, I can't do this forever. And the only other thing I ever wanted to do was um, work with animals. So I went, oh, well, I'll go back to uni and study zoology and follow that career. So I guess the two came together in that way. And um, uh, I think, like a lot of people say to me, like art and science, they're so far apart, like the opposite ends of the spectrum. But for me, they're not. They're actually uh, essential. Like you need to employ those creative uh, narrative skills and visual skills to be able to communicate what the science says to the general public. So they're, they're absolutely married together for me. That's a really interesting point. I, mm. I, f I felt that way when, uh, when I got into horticulture. I never thought mm. I had an artistic bone in my <laughs> body, but, but horticulture, plant selection, expressing ideas in, um, in garden design and, uh, you know, understanding texture and form yes. is is, yeah. is is absolutely the basis of being a good horticulturist so uh, yes. um and i think I, as well on that note I, I love that it's um like art and drawing teaches you to be observant like you cannot create a, a drawing without being observant and a large part of being a good scientist is being observant as well so i think that's a really key skill as well that those yep. areas. You, you were just um, mentioning that you did did some illustration, some training in illustration. Yes. Do do you ever um well, did you ever think of doing a um uh, a, a a visual book with where you would be the author and the illustrator? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I didn't. Um. <laughs> Yeah, I, of course not, especially not with myself as the main character. Isn't that weird? <laughs> it was very weird um, drawing Microlite Millie as a character. I actually wanted to be Microlite Millie and not just Millie in the book because it felt like, you know, the character calling her Microlite Millie gave me a little bit of separation. <laughs> You're able to step back just a little bit. <laughs> a little bit, just a little bit. <laughs> Yeah. You're able to put 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 four meters of aluminium between between you and the public. <laughs> yeah, something like that. It was it, it was such a trip, but uh, yeah, it's been an amazing experience. I'm still spinning out, out about all of it, really. Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, there's been a couple of um, reasons that you've had to delay uh, the, the project, 
at a couple of times. So yeah. you know, obviously, obviously COVID, but but <clears throat> tell us about the plaster casts. How... <laughs> yeah, I can't was... I, I can't let you walk away from that one, Millie. <laughs> Thanks. I don't think anyone's ever going to let me walk away from that ever. So um, in 2018, I, I got, I finally got my micro light and I was like, yes, this is it. The project's happening. And I went, oh, well, now I've got my plane. I should really get some flying experience in different parts of the country. So I thought I'd do a recce trip. And um, the wonderful thing about the micro light is that you can take the wing off the base and fold it up it is a hang glider wing so you can fold it up to the hang glider wing and put it on the roof racks of your car and um the base the trike base goes in the trailer so i was going to tow it around the country set it up at different airfields go for a fly it was going to be amazing and raise money on the way and all the rest of it <laughs> anyway we left lake macquarie in august and got to kabulcha airfield Three days later and I was setting up the micro light for the first time with my mate Neil Schaefer from he's actually another trike pilot who's at Recreational Aviation Australia and um, we just set the micro light up to go flying and I went to put the trailer back on the back of the car and the, the jockey wheel wasn't latched into place and um, it collapsed and the hitch of the trailer fell on my left leg and cracked my tibia so um, I broke my leg three days into the recce trip, so I did zero flying. Um, <laughs> but we decided to keep going because I, this is me and my mate Phil who came with me, um, we decided to keep travelling around the country because the the Broome Bird Observatory Congress and Camp Out was happening that year and we had a fundraiser on there. So I got there and we did the fundraiser, which turned out to be a massive flop. Um <laughs> And uh, uh, just before you go on, what, why do you think that was? Because because everybody knows about, or everyone in bird bird world in Australia knows about the Broome Observatory. Yeah. Um, what why do you think that that was a flop? Oh, I don't know. I think it, maybe it just wasn't the right time. Um, uh, a friend had organised for me to give a talk at the uh, the Mangrove Hotel that night, and um, had organised drinks and stuff, but that evening was also another huge football event on in um, Broome, I think it was, or some big community event. So people out in the community uh, were all going to that already. So I think it was a timing thing. So a lot of people didn't come along and buy a ticket. Um, we ended up breaking even. So I shouldn't say it was the biggest flop, but we broke even in terms of money. Um, so it was a bit disappointing, but it, it just wasn't the right timing, you know. So we kept going on and got to Perth and uh, my mate Phil is from Perth so we stayed at his place for a while and um, I was recovering from my broken leg there and uh, while I was at his place I slipped in the bathroom getting my crutches and I broke my right wrist as well. <laughs> as you see I've got a scar. There you go. Yeah, oh. and, uh... <laughs> When, when one thing happens, something else happens. It's always the way, isn't it? So, yeah. are you fully healed now? Is everything's oh. everything's fine? You can, are you can you run around the block now? Are you oh, out doing yeah. bird a minute? Oh, I haven't been doing bird a minute. I've been a bit absorbed by other things, but I I do know of that. Yeah, Jeremy invited me to that bird a minute page. <laughs> Looks <Yeah>. intense. <laughs> I just want to I just have to go back to back to the book for a minute, mm -hmm. um, Millie. Um, Jackie Karen, how did yeah. how did how did your um, uh, collaboration with Jackie Karen come about? Jackie is, of oh. course, the author of the book. That was the point of asking Millie about being the author and the and the illustrator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so Jackie, uh, I met Jackie at the Australasian Shorebird Conference in Hobart in uh, at the end of twenty eighteen. And uh, she's a good friend of Kate Gorringe Smith, who I'm sure many of you know from the Overwintering Project, which is the and the Flyway Print Exchange, which are both massive shorebird print exhibitions that she's collaborated with artists through all the all throughout the Flyway to bring those together and raise money for Bird Life's migratory shorebird program. It's pretty amazing. So Kate's a friend of mine, and she introduced me to Jackie. And Jackie even said to me at that conference, she said we should do a book together someday. 
And then, you know, you know, seven months later, I'm like, Jackie, I've got off with this book deal. You want to work with me? And she was like, hell yeah. So that's how oh, that one came out. That's great. So so you didn't need to do any of the uh, the, the hard work um, with CSIRO, with, with pulling the whole project together. You, you, no. You, yeah. That's this one a... fell in my lap. It was, it's one of those serendipitous things that happened. Yeah. That I did not foresee. <laughs> so we have to we have to do the plug. Buy the book. Buy the book. Um, how many how many illustrations have you done uh, for mm -hmm. it, Millie? Like how much time yeah. apart yeah. from flying and and uh, learning learning how to fly, maintaining your aircraft, yep. um, doing all of your publicity and whatnot. Mm -hmm. How much how much time has it taken you to actually do all the illustrations? Yeah, it took ages. So um from getting the book deal in twenty nineteen, uh it was uh I started doing the illustrations at the end of twenty twenty. So it took that long to get the contract sorted, to get the script to a point where it was signed off on. Because this is my first foray into children's books, so I was learning as I went along and uh, all the stages so yeah you have to write the book they have to approve it you have to have an editor go all over it all um sign off on it all before they'll let you start doing illustrations you have to prepare storyboards so um oh there's a big thunderstorm happening here um yeah so uh i started the illustrations in december of 2020 and i finished them in december of 2021 so well yeah about a year that's uh, it's a lot of dedication, a lot of planning, a lot of time yeah. mm -hmm. uh, involved in, in, in getting something done. Yeah. What, what do you want the ongoing legacy of the flight, of actually mm -hmm. completing the flight? Because you will complete it. It's going to be a massive success <laughs> and, the, and, the, uh, and the crowdfunding is going to go off. But uh, what, what do you hope? will perhaps be what will people be saying about wing threads in five years time hmm. oh wow that's a really big question isn't it i would love to see birds like um bartel godwin and eastern curlew and redneck stint to be like well-known names as flagship species like you know blue whale and orangutan and the panda you know and deemed as worthy of protection and for people to have an understanding of our wetlands and the importance of those wetlands not just for birds but for us as well as people because these wetlands provide us with important ecosystem services like clean water and livelihoods and food um, they provide buffers against storms and uh, help uh, store carbon for climate change, you know, all of these massive things. And I think people often look at wetlands like swamps and stuff like that as boggy, ugly mud flats or whatever, and they don't see the value in it or the importance of it. And they're often the first place that houses are built on and that sort of thing because they're not seen as like there's anything there. So I, I would love people to uh, engage with the birds and the wetlands that they are uh, inhabit and um, see their own connection as part of a larger global ecological network. Because I really think that, I would say to people, shorebirds are my greatest teachers because their migration path links over four and a half billion people across 23 countries and three continents in our East Asian Australasian flyway. And that path is like a chain with links in it, you know, they're stopping at each of those wetlands along the way. And if one of those links fails, you know, they, they can't complete that migration path. So understanding our local wetlands within that global context, I think really helps us to put us back in the space of nature, to see ourselves as part of nature and not separate to it. Because I think a lot of, um, I think people often see ourselves as separate to it these, these days and therefore um, not having uh, an impact on it. So I would really love, I would really love to see that that connection, reconnection with nature. Yeah. Now, I, I'll, I'm going to ask you something as a follow on to that, but first, yeah. it wouldn't be the bird emergency <laughs> if I didn't inject some kind of 
uh, vaguely uh, provocative politically and perhaps uh, stupid commentary. But yeah. today I've I've been I got up this morning and um, our defence minister said something about China and and linking China with our uh, with our opposition leader and whatnot. And I watched a whole lot of commentary on the different channels flicking around this morning. China, 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 China. Not once did anyone uh, note that China and Australia are connected by this incredibly important uh, e ecological system, this movement of organisms up and down. Not one person made any kind of connection to anything about how intrinsically connected Australia, China, Japan, the Southeast Asian nations and Australia are. And I'm all... I'm always frustrated about that. That's one of the reasons I do this, why I sit here every day and talk to amazing people like you who are working in this field. When, on, on a day when, when the koala is, is listed now as endangered, why isn't, why isn't anybody in media running a regular segment talking to you, talking to Tegan, talking to... Claire talking about nature. I mean, we all know who bloody Lizzo is is uh, is divorcing or dating or you know whatever stupid pop star rubbish, movie star rubbish. Why haven't we found space in our public discourse for our own amazing, unique uh, nature? Mm. There we go. There. Do you think we do you think we're doing it? Do you think we're doing any better? Like in, yeah. in in ten years, do you think we're actually doing any better? Because because there seems to be a whole lot of publicity in certain cor corners about projects, but we're not really doing any better on a whole, are we? This is a really interesting question. Um, I'm glad because it was a bloody <laughs> long one. <laughs> That's all right. I might have a bloody long answer for you. Um, <laughs> Yeah, you've actually just tapped into my interest in conservation psychology. So I'm really fascinated by how we actually frame environmental messaging. And um, I don't know if you're familiar with the Cartman drama triangle. Do you know about this? No, learn me. Learn right. me, Amelia. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the Cartman drama triangle is a framework that describes dysfunctional conflict dynamics. And a lot of, um, uh, well, the media uses it a lot and uh, so does a lot of our conservation messaging. And, and it's um, based on a triangle framework, as you can imagine, where what you do is you, what, what we do in conservation messaging a lot, for example, is we frame something as a victim. So it could be a threatened species or some threatened species are framed as a victim. And um, then you have a perpetrator who's doing something wrong and they're responsible or at fault for uh, causing the threatened species to become extinct. So it could be the industry or mining or whatever. And uh, then that campaign uses that dynamic to uh, ask the audience to come and rescue that species, often by donating money or something like that. And uh, the problem is it works in the short term in terms of getting donations. But what the dynamic also sets up is a disempowerment framework. So what happens, and we unintentionally disempower ourselves. So what we do is when we say that thing over there that is causing this problem um, that is completely out of my control, uh, if that needs to change if things are going to get better, then what you do is you undermine your own agency and you start to feel powerless and like you can't do anything. And when you repeat that message over and over again because you want people to keep donating, what people start to hear is, well, well you have to keep painting a picture of things not getting better in order for that to keep working, that dynamic. So when you keep repeating that message over and over, people start to go, oh, it doesn't matter what I do, nothing ever seems to get any better. And you get this picture that everything's just going to shit and it doesn't matter what we do. And I think what we've done over time 
is unintentionally created an unhealthy imbalance towards showing what's wrong instead of also showing the things that are working and the things that are going right. So when Jackie and I wrote A Shorebird Flying Adventure, I deliberately chose I deliberately chose to move away from this drama triangle framework and there's lots of rescuing language that is used in environmental messaging like let's save let's yes. save yes. shorebirds let's yes. let's fight for them let's get angry and if we get angry and invite other people to get on the angry bank bandwagon as well and get angry at people um, who are responsible for this and it's a punitive system as well we use shame and blame to mm. punish mm. The perpetrator and, and I'm, I'm um, guilty of that I'm, I, oh, I've, 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 I've got to be got to be honest with it, I'm, it yeah, it's same. really easy to it's, it's easy so to locate easy. a villain so a villain easy. yeah yes it's really easy so easy uh, and, and Jackie and I when we wrote the shorebird flying adventure we didn't want to use any of that rescue language it was so hard it was so hard because I'm so used to using that framework in in environmental messaging that to create something different was really, really challenging and we struggled with the script for a long time. So the opposite of the drama triangle is called the empowerment dynamic. So what you do with that one instead is that you frame uh, an issue like threatened species extinction as a challenge. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then you have uh, a coach or a guide as well instead of a, uh, a rescuer. And that could be a, a, a scientific organisation or a researcher or um, for myself in the book, it's, it's Microlite Millie. And they have the knowledge and the data and the scientific know-how to give the creator the information they need to come up with a vision and look at what we can do to find solutions to tackle the challenge. So what that does is it gives the audience back their agency and the power to start thinking creatively or the space to start thinking creatively. There's nothing like shame and blame and punishment to squash the <laughs> to squash creativity. And that's mm. what the drama triangle does. So it's in the book at the end, what we do instead of saying, you know, don't drive on the beach and pick up your rubbish and, you know, don't spook the shorebirds. We actually say, imagine a world where our wetlands are protected and restored. Um, Imagine a world where shorebirds get to roost and feed in peace. So inviting people to start thinking about what we do want instead of what we don't want, because that's another thing. I think if you walked into a room of people and said, who here has a dystopian vision of the future where everything goes to hell and humans have wrecked the planet and we all die? I think, I think everybody would put their hand up, right? And then if I said, who, who in this room has a vision of the future where we, we manage to get it together and work things out and it's rocky for a while but we largely solve the climate, climate problem get ourselves back on track and, and eventually it turns out okay i mean how many people would put their hand up for that i, I think very few uh, that that's the thing that's the thing that i dream about it's like yeah it's like i've got the comfortable pillow and i've got the hard pillow and i, I, yeah. I never know which one i want to have on top um yeah what this is an interesting one because I, I think you can't you can't get to that place without having a, a at least starting to create a vision about it and talking about it and it's not about sticking your head in the sand and pretending that bad things aren't happening it's creating space for both things to exist at, at the same time I think. yeah uh, I'll, I'll tell you because you can't stop me <laughs> about what 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 frustrates me, Millie, is, you know, I'm like everyone else. You get up and you make your cuppa and you, you get your breakfast together and you put on the TV and that's either, you know, News Breakfast or Koshi and Nat or whoever the, the bozos, the, the, the same but different bozos are on Channel 9. Um, yeah. And they're always doing these meaningless stories about, Oh, which suburbs will perform best in, in in the property market? In blah 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 blah, and and bloody bloody blast released a report saying interest rates will probably do the same thing they did for a hundred years, and uh, you know here's this new amazing weight loss 
thing or here's this new miracle treatment for cancer and they they get five minutes of time every uh, in every news bulletin in every magazine program on tv and then they sink without a trace Mm -hmm. maybe 15 years or so a a, 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 a patent is actually granted and you can actually go and buy that miracle thing but i've only been doing this a short term short time and nearly everybody that i interview is an amazing communicator with a with a with a body of work that gives them credibility a personality that enables them to communicate and you you and i'm 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 in, encompassing all of you are not on these you know you can wheel in a snake or a cuddly chick or a you know a a possum or something every day on on these shows and tell a different story and give a different message but is it just that the money is not backing it that somebody then can't say to the network but we'll buy we'll spend three hundred thousand dollars in spots in prime time over the next three months if you bring on you know conservation person like the finance industry does you know, we'll mm. make we'll make a hundred hours of content for you as long as you interview our expert every month, two months, or whatever. It, do you think? Do you think I'm? Am I on the right track there? And 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 if mm. I am, how can we possibly combat that? Even though I don't want to use negative messaging, how can mm. we? How can we counter that? How can we put the positive messages and put the hit? The heroes, the heroes of conservation and research in front of people because people are going to like you when they meet you. That's my frustrating thing. See, you're all really, really good at what you do, but you're really great communicators and nobody is meeting you. It's only nerds like me that are meeting you, you know? Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure the question that you're asking okay. that, that <laughs> Yeah, yeah, d- d- people on the and, and yeah, and does it frustrate you that the whole architecture, I guess, oh, the okay. conservation architecture, the money architecture, mm-hmm. doesn't allow for f- to, to combat mm. or compete with the because because no matter way which way you slice it and dice it, um, the finance industry is not going to be conservation minded unless we change our property and development market. You know our our sort of well-being f- messaging is always about building more, doing more. Yeah. That doesn't really so, line up with right. with the stuff, which, which in turn means that we have to press the panic button to save everything. And it, it, it's not about retention; it's about pres- it's about surviving at the last minute. You know, which is mm-hmm. why I had to call the thing of the bird emergency. If, if if I called it conservation success stories, no one no one would listen. You know, they'd go, "Oh yeah." Well, I think that's a, a point in itself. Like, um, well, why why can't you have conservation success stories in there as well? I think that the the two well, are key. Um, well, that's what I do. I talk about conservation success stories, but if I just put success stories in in a list of endless podcasts that's the last thing people click on we're all conditioned to it that's the problem yeah, that's what i was going to say yeah, yeah we're all conditioned to it i would agree and, and that's really the conversation that i, I want to start with with people is how do we start to turn that around because um i think that it works in the short term but in the long term what we end up with is um uh, burnout and uh di- then disempowerment it's a disempowerment dynamic that um is is not sustainable and um uh i I would hope that you're let let's put a challenge let's challenge let's (laughs) challenge mainstream media (laughs) like they give a shit um, Um, i i don't know because i I wouldn't it be great that everywhere you land you know all the towns that the local news crew who and all the the commercial local news crews are begging for government money because it's not fair that the ABC have got local reporters and we don't. But shouldn't the ABC and the local news people be turning up, interviewing you, 
wanting to get you into the studio to do a uh, to do an interview with you. That's the world I want to see, Millie. That would that... be awesome. Um, yeah. Yeah, it would be really awesome. I, I, I'm probably the least political person that you would you have on your show, Grant. Yeah, well, I, that's why. That, <laughs> look, find nobody work. else needs to be political. I'm, I'm doing more than enough of that myself. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. I Sorry if you're enduring yeah. it too, by the way. <laughs> no, it's okay. I find it quite fascinating. I deliberately, um, well, I, I engage with it as little as possible because it brings me down and um, I find it... Um, leads me into that space where I am getting resentful and depressed and upset and I can't operate on the level that I want to be at if I'm in that space. And I, I think for myself, I, I've learned you can't change other people. You can only change yourself and be an example of what you would like to see out there and I focus on that and the people that want to engage with that. And the people who, um, you know, I could be banging my head on a wall trying to get someone to be into what I, I do and think how I think for, forever, or I could go and engage with the people over here who get it and connect with it and start to grow that community and work with them and let the people who aren't with us go about their business and, and let us grow our thing and focus on that. That's sort of where... I direct my energy. Does that answer your question? <laughs> oh, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, it, it, it does. I'll, I'll take on all the negative stuff for you, Millie, so you don't so you don't need to. I, I, I totally appreciate that, um, uh, that mindset, that standpoint, mm -hmm. because because it's it's so frustrating. Um, it's very frustrating. But, but I feel like I have to be the person who runs over and uh, and bashes into that group standing over there who don't think the way that, that, that you do. Because once in a while, one of them might wake up and go, hey, that looks like a pretty good party. And then they might come over to this side. That's, that's sort of the best we can, we can hope for in, in, in a way. Mm. Um, it, it's, it's just really frustrating because I think people, I think people really do care about, uh, yes, do. Uh, yeah. uh, about the plight of the koala. And mm -hmm. and the numbat and the golden shouldered parrot and the countless others, but I don't think they I, I don't think they they get the messaging about what they can do to change it. Mm -hmm. And like like you said, you set it up perfectly. Everyone's been conditioned into having mortal combat over mm -hmm. conservation. You know, yeah. chaining yourselves to bulldozers, blockading, all that stuff, which has its point. Um, has its place and it's it's yes. the only way that's been effective because we are not able to work like little termites from the inside you know that where we where we're getting into the structures where the the money and the profit is is to facilitate change so that's why i call you guys heroes and and warriors <laughs> and whatnot because it i think you must be stronger than me Millie, in terms, of, oh. in terms of always seeing it at work, always, you know. Um, but let, look, that that's enough of me doing that. Let's talk about the the the, the your job at BirdLife. Um, oh. What what's what is the Shellbirds program um, specifically, mm -hmm. and maybe explain a little bit about how the little all you, the different project officers and everything at BirdLife. Um, run run their race okay um so the migratory shorebird program in bird life has two major components the first one is the citizen science program which is uh, we rely on a lot of we rely on volunteers all around australia to do uh shorebird population monitoring for us and we have a biannual count so we get uh, our volunteers to go out twice a year once in summer and once in winter to count waders all around the country. And those data uh, uh, help us keep track of um, shorebird populations uh, throughout Australia every year. And uh, the second component is working with uh, community groups around the country starting to do site action planning. So um, myself and Marta Ferenzi, who's another shorebird officer at BirdLife, we've been 
uh, we've done, uh, I can't remember the number now, I think I think it's 18. I've done three here in the Hunter and Port Stephens and Manning River and Matt has done several in South Australia and Victoria now. So they're under the, as part of the Migratory Shorebird Conservation Action Plan that um, Dan Weller helped to put together years ago with um, Connie, Connie Lee, uh, they identified uh, all the important shorebird sites around Australia and um, uh, helped put together the National Directory of Important Shorebird Habitat as well. It's another important document that finally got published last year and you can download on the BirdLife website. So we're targeting those areas to develop these site action plans and come up with a list of actions that um, it's, it's sort of like a wish list of all the things. Like if we could do absolutely everything in this area for shorebirds, what would it look like? So getting all the local land managers and councils and parks and wildlife, all of those groups together to discuss and come up with this list of actions and then putting that together into a working document that they can then have a look at and um, prioritise which actions can be done first and what's more, most feasible. And uh, my part of my job has been to create a working group here in the Hunter Valley of people from all of those different organisations and um, chair meetings so that we can uh, start to implement actions from those site action plans. So I'm hoping to expand on that site action planning process with different organisations around the country to achieve overall objectives in the in the MS CAP. This yeah. might be a hard one, Millie. Who, All right. <laughs> who's your conservation hero? Oh, who's my conservation hero? Um, oh, that is a hard one, isn't it? Oh, I, I really love Jane Goodall. I think she's incredible. And I love I love that she brings the heart and the science together. And that's that's something very important to me. You can have all the facts and you don't have the heart. It's very hard to communicate it and connect with other people and connect other people with what you do. Um, uh, so, I, yeah, she's a, she's a big one for me. Well, that was my soft lead in. That was my soft lead into the uh, uh, to the hard hitting bird emergency questions for you, Millie. Oh no! So, are, are, are you ready? You, be, you better strap in. Uh, check check your altimeter. Oh, no, make sure everything's <laughs> everything's fine. Yeah, I'm scared, Grant. Okay. Well, this is the one that sorts out the the, the wheat from the chaff. Yeah. What? is your field guide of choice Ooh, okay well i'd say the one i use the most is the pizian night app on my phone <laughs> the best. um oh but i like to refer to the, the csiro australian field guide too um but yeah probably pizian night on my phone is the, my go-to that's <laughs> So that, that that's a good lead into the to the next question. When you're out doing field work, yeah. um, what's your essential piece of kit or mm. equipment? I mean, what if if I said to you, Millie, we're going bird watching, but you can only bring one thing? Yeah. Oh, I just take my binos. For, good. For yeah. And uh, and uh, are you with the new little compact? once or if you got a big old clunker no i just got the nikon monarchs yeah okay, came nikon by monarchs. yeah hello, hello nikon you know <laughs> <laughs> there's a sponsorship opportunity going here nikon i don't see your name on the wing threads uh uh page um well, you know, just, that's right i'm j just saying or even zeiss don't leave them out I'm, Michael, Michael, uh, yeah, that's right uh, there, there is a sponsorship opportunity for for bird watching. Um, actually, that begs the question. I have to ask: Wh when you're up in the air, like you know, we see the fantasy um, movies about the flying with the geese, and there's uh, I see a lot of people doing stuff on YouTube where they're to me it's harassing. They're harassing migratory birds and whatnot. But is that fantasy? You're up you're up flying, and then the birds just go, "Oh, look." There's a man-made contraption flying down our flight path. Let, let's go and join in. Is, does that yeah. ever happen to you, Millie? 
Oh, it's fantasy with the shorebirds, that's for sure. They're way too flighty to, to be bothered with my aircraft. But I have had moments where I've flown with birds. So uh, I took off at Maitland Airfield one time and there was a pair of pelicans right next to me and I was close enough to see them, like, give me the side eye and just, like, peel off to the right. And I was just like, yeah, no. <laughs> As they went. And I've flown um, with wedgetail eagles and um, often see sea eagles down the coast and... Uh, a while ago, I was coming in on finals at Lake Macquarie Airport and I had white-throated needle tail tails next to me. So that was amazing. And I saw white-throated needle tails at Lake Macquarie Airport yesterday too, which was really cool. Um, uh, so, yeah, you, you do see the birds out there. I'm so old, Millie. I still have to call them spine-tailed swifts. Oh, so, okay, sure. So... <laughs> <laughs> uh, I like to think that... that with their amazing eyesight that maybe the uh, the sea eagles or the wedgies are actually coming in to check it to check out yeah. which which one is at this time coming along <laughs> but, but but then then i think no reality would probably prevail that the only birds that would be um uh, checking out a man-made contraption and joining in would probably be the bin chicken so <laughs> you can probably get a bunch of bin chickens following you around um, mine's bin chicken I love a bin chicken. <laughs> uh, for for international listeners, the bin chicken is the um, well. You know, you're the ornithologist amongst us. Uh, uh, I still call them white ibis. What what do I have to call them today if I get my Australian bird guide? I think it's an Australian white ibis. Yeah. Australian white ibis. I think so yeah. Uh, sacred ibis, black necked yeah, ibis. Yeah, I used to call been. them sacred ibis. Yeah. 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 Yeah, always been a white obvious to me. Okay, Millie. Well, um, now, what's your what's your uh, bird watching bucket list location? If you could choose one Ooh. place anywhere in the world that you want to go, in the uh, world, ticking off your list. Okay. Um, where do I want to go? Ticking off my list in the world. I think I'm still just wrapping my head around Australia. To be honest. Well, it can be in Australia. Australia's <laughs> in the world. Last time I checked. <clears throat> I really want to go to far north Queensland. That's where I want to go. And um, oh, I was meant to go on a bird banding trip up at Lockhart River uh, a couple of years ago and COVID put a stupid kibosh on it because the border was shut and we couldn't go. It was so demo. But, yeah, far north Queensland, that, that's where I want to go. <laughs> and and of all the places that you've been so far, Millie, where, mm -hmm. where's your favourite place that you've been bird watching? Oh, I would have to say it's 80 Mile Beach in northwest Australia. Um, that's incredible, and Robot Bay. When I was up there, the first time I went to 80 Mile Beach was on the expedition with the Australasian Way to Studies group, and it was a year where there were just hundreds of thousands of Pratt and Coles, and at one point we were banding birds on the beach and uh, we looked up and you couldn't see the sand anymore because the, the the sand was just covered with hundreds of thousands of Pratt and Coles all the way to the horizon. You just couldn't, I, I've never seen anything like it. It was just phenomenal. Well, yeah. Let, let's talk about the Pratt and Coles for a minute. <laughs> Is that a um, an unusual uh, amount of Pratt and Coles to be uh, Overwintering in Australia? Um, well, it wasn't overwintering. It was uh, in February, so okay. it was just before they took off on migration. But uh, uh, it's a seasonal thing, so I, I can't remember if it's when there's it's been a, a lot of rain or it's been a dry a year. I can't remember. But all the locusts come out and they come to the plains to eat the locusts. <clears throat> so it varies the number of pratt and coals that show up there every year. We we just have so much more to understand about, we about do. birds like that. About how how do they know where yes. where the locusts are going to be? Or once the locusts are there, how do they how do I they know. communicate over such vast distances that hey dinner is served down there? Yeah, you know? it's incredible, uh, isn't it? It is. Yeah. It's amazing. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, what's your bucket list bird? What's the Ooh. Oh my goodness! Um, what's my bucket list bird? Oh, I'm so unprepared. Um, <laughs> what's my bucket list bird? Um, oh, but I've got like a huge 
reduce list. <laughs> that, 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 that's the challenge. You have to look. I'll, 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 I had to let um, I had to let someone the other day, David Tan, who's uh, studying pitters and bird strike in Asia. Yeah. Had to, he had to whittle it down to a uh, uh, to a family, and he almost got down to genus. Of course, he got yeah. into the pitters. You, yes. I'll give you a bit of leeway. Oh, okay, sure. <laughs> Well, I'm still, I'm still yet to see an Asian dowager, which is very frustrating after being to groom several times. Um, so that's on there. Um, what else is on there? Oh, yeah, in the hunter, I'm, I'm still trying to find the noisy pitter here. So that would be on my list as well. Um, yeah. Oh, I, oh, I'm thinking of all the different birds I've missed. When I went to Tassie, I dipped on 40 spotted pard loads, which was really disappointing. So I still got to get that one. Um, oh, this, yeah. <laughs> it, it is, is it too hard? It, it, even the bucket list bird is too hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> have, so have you tipped off the spoonbilled um, sandpiper? Oh, no, I haven't. Oh, is my bucket list bird like all over the world? Yeah, we yeah. Oh right. We, yeah. We, we're we're not building artificial walls here, really. You can you can dream big on this show. I can dream big on this show. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, I would love to see a shoe bill. Actually, I think that would be pretty epic. <laughs> oh, I think so. I think uh, I think so. I mean, they're they're terrifying. Um, they would be terrifying. Yeah. They are terrifying. Um, they're, yeah. They're, just imagine if if you had the opportunity to spend some time in in, in Shoebill Swamp, yeah. and you got to know a Shoebill, and and it was like a sweetie, it was like a big bird, uh, not some terrifying <laughs> reptilian <laughs> bloody thing. That's imagine weird. if that they come over and they give you want to rest there, rest oh. on your shoulder and give you a bit of a cuddle. Oh, that's creepy, yeah. isn't it? That's the stuff of that nightmares, really. Creepy. They are quite terrifying. <laughs> I'll let you give that one a try, Grant. <laughs> well, oh, if only I got the opportunity to go to a, a shooting swamp. Would that would be that. great. Well, that, that leads us into the one where you, you don't get any leeway, really. What What's your favourite bird? Oh, I think, um, well, my favourite shorebird would have to be a ruddy turnstone because I do love calling them Rudy Toonstones and I just think they're they're very they're very funny. <laughs> can, <laughs> the little orange legs and their, their fat bones. Can I tell um, you a turnstone story just before yes, we, we move yeah. on? Uh, I interviewed uh, Claire O'Neill who is yeah. a photographer in uh, in Cornwall the, the other day. And she was telling me that with her work photographing shorebirds in, in yeah. the UK there's a particular problem, and she noticed it in turnstones. Human hair that is washing up on beaches is wrapping around the toes of turnstones, really? causing them to be amputated. You yeah. know how we see seagulls and pigeons in the city with their yeah, with yeah. their malformed feet. That's happening yeah. to turnstones on the coast of Cornwall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. That's Amazing. Incredible. Yeah, right. Now you nominated turn turnstones as your favourite chill bird. Yeah. Favourite bird. Oh, Come on. My it's, bird. it's tough. Oh, I really love the crested shrike tit. I just think they're total dudes. <laughs> they are. I really think they're awesome with their little mohawk going on there. So yeah. and I love the colours as well. So, yeah. it, did, was that Satellas? No, I said I love the colours as well. Oh, the colours. I thought you said you love Satellas yeah. as well. well Who doesn't love, love a Satella? You know? I do love a Satella too. Yeah. Who doesn't love a Satella? But, <laughs> but if you had to choose one. One? Yeah. Of, the the of best those bird. Two, best bird ever. Um, there's oh. only one There's only one out for that question. Okay. Well, and then I'll, I'll, I will have to say a stint, a redneck stint, because... Of my stints are rad, and it's really my flagship bird for wing threads. So we'll go with the redneck. Oh, stint. very, very <laughs> nice. Yeah, I, 
I love the stint. And, and, and the stint is almost emblematic of all the things we've been talking about before, yeah. about the, the, the familiarity, yet the complete lack of familiarity that yeah. we have with shorebirds. It's true. Running around on a beach near you right now, you've probably seen it a hundred times and you've yeah. probably yeah. never yeah. noticed it. And that's yeah. the... That's the thing about yeah. red neck stints. I'll, I'll, I'll just say to anyone who's watching who is a potential guest on the bird emergency, the only out for that question is that the best bird is every bird. Okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I'll okay. remember that for next time. Yeah, that, that is. Well, um, Millie, it's been great to, to meet you. I am so glad, actually, before you started all the publicity stuff, Holly did... Um, it did tell me you've got to speak to Millie. You've got to speak to Millie. So I went. I went stalking Thanks, the Holly. website, and that was and and that was and, and that was how I noticed. Oh my God, she's got a plaster on her leg. What ha oh. what happened here? But I, yeah. I think I think because we're talking about the project, I just think it's so hard to get sponsors, right? Yeah. yeah. So let's let's give them let's give them a bit of airplay. Um, of course, BirdLife, BirdLife Australia is sponsoring yeah. the project. Um, do you yeah. know them all off by heart or do you want me to run them, run through I them? Can, I can run them off, yeah. So Good. <laughs> my biggest sponsor is the Peel Kahavi Catchment Council in WA, which is a Peel Estuary is one of the major shorebird sites in WA. They supported me. Airborne Australia, Airplan EFB, they got me in-kind support with their navigation software. Australian Geographic, Remember the Wild, BirdLife Australia. Um, uh, oh, no, I'm forgetting a couple. There's East Asian Australasian Flyway Partnership, the Hunted Bird Observers Club, Robot Bay Working Group, White Gum Aviation, uh, and I'm forgetting someone, aren't I, Grant? Uh, Bittens in, Bittens in yeah, Rice, Wade Crest. Wade um, Crest, yeah, they're on my plane. UWA. Um, uh, remember the wild, of course. Yeah, you, you've actually got more because you've rattled off more than are actually on yeah, the, on the website. Sponsors. So that yeah. so that's great. Um, well done to Thank all you. the organisations that have come on board. Especially well yeah. done to you for yeah. putting it all together. Um, mm. The book is in what do we call it? Pre pre production, pre publication. It's currently in print right now in um with csiro and uh it comes out in june but you can pre-order it through the crowdfunding campaign which gives me a little bit of an extra donation too if you're into that or you can pre-order it directly through excuse me csiro publishing website um yeah so they're the two ways you can get your hands on it yep. so so if you can please do um buy the book and uh let me just refresh chuff.org and ah oh, there we go somebody's put a couple of hundred bucks in in the since oh, we've been talking nice. millie Lovely. so Thank you. <laughs> so that uh, that's great Thank good you. on you do do head out to chuff.org and check out a shorebird flying adventure and kick in a couple of bucks or or if you want to remain anonymous and kick in uh what do we need uh 50 54 thousand uh yeah. 120 25 dollars uh, oh, well, if you've got that lying around <laughs> kick that in too uh, well, i've been telling people you know sponsor a kilometer for five bucks if we had all twenty thousand ah. kilometers around the country sponsored for five dollars we'd have a hundred thousand dollars wouldn't that be well different? So. That's exactly the 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 way to do it. Uh, that's great, Millie. We'll uh, we'll talk more about maybe some other uh, possibilities that we might be able to um, yeah, that'd be awesome. build up that that total. And um, I'll put you on the spot now, Millie. I want to do some <laughs> uh, some updates as you're going okay. around the uh, uh, around the country. So keep in touch, oh, and we'll yeah. we'll, organ we'll organise that because. Um, as much as I want it to happen, I don't think that win news or prime news are going to be there when you land every day. Hopefully, they are at some yeah, locations. Today, today. <laughs> um, but but um, maybe we can work out a way to stream something onto your website um, uh, as you as you go around. If that's something that you that you would uh, would want to do, so yeah, I think that'd be really fun, Grant. Let's do it. 
Let's do it. Let's do it. Hey, Costa, come on for a question and answer session with us, uh, and 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 lend, lend your not insignificant uh, um, public profile. There we go. Oh, shoot, that's unfair, isn't it? That's totally unfair. But hey, I've done it. It's too late. Now. Yeah. <laughs> Millie, thanks. Thanks so much for for coming on board. Thanks um, for inviting me, Grant. Don't break yeah. anything else in. No. In, in, in and uh, <laughs> actually. Ha how are you getting across to Broome? I mean, that's uh, mm -hmm. uh, that's an undertaking in itself. Yeah, it will be. So I'll have to trailer the microlight up there. So i am just got my fingers crossed for the border <laughs> opening by May, but I've got a backup plan. So if the border if the border opens, but we can't get up to the Kimberley for if they're restricting movement up there, I will start at White Gum Farm, which is where I learned to fly in WA. Just near Perth because it's got obviously sentimental significance for me. And um, if the WA border doesn't open at all, then I will take off from here in Newcastle in Lake Macquarie and head north. And um, hopefully the border will be open by the time I get around. <laughs> and look, we, uh, I'll, I'll just uh, for the viewers, you can you can read those comments. But thanks, um, Annie. Um, thanks, Annie. Do you want to read read that one out? Uh, oh, sure. Really? It's, it's, um, See, yeah, this was a wonderful conversation. Loved it. Go, Millie. Excited about the book and good luck on a successful fundraising. Cheers, Annie. Yeah, thanks, Annie. Uh, and it, that's what it's all about, people getting behind you and um, and making sure that it is a success. And, of course, let's let's remember, it's not all about Millie. It's all about the shorebirds, right? So, about the birds. <laughs> and, and sometimes it pays to, uh, uh, to, to do something. And thanks, Costa. Um, He's. Uh, we. I'll, I'll reach out to you again on. Uh, actually, Costa, you can let us know what what the best way to do that is, and I think it would be great to follow Millie around, and um, I, I really want to know how the kids take to the whole, uh, to the whole thing once they once they meet you and they understand what Ooh. what you're doing, yeah. and to see what kind of excitement it generates because hey. Uh, didn't someone say, oh, I believe the children are our future? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm keen to see how the kids respond to it as well. So Yeah. And and yeah. And, and, and look, who knows what will come out of out of it. I mean the opportunity to pr to produce a whole lot of um maybe programs and educational material for people to use down the track, you know. Oh, You're gonna no. be Got sponsorship from Hunter Bird Observers Club and the East Asian Australasian Flyway Partnership to put together an online e-learning pack that's going to accompany the book. So I've started putting that together. I, I want to create 10 uh, lesson plans and online videos that teachers can then access for free. Each one's a different topic that goes into more depth about different uh, details about shorebirds so that they can bring shorebirds into the classroom because that's one of the biggest difficulties that we face is, you know, getting it out there in an educational way. There's an, only a limited number of bird life staff to go and do professional development workshops, but if there was an online resource for people to access, um, that would be amazing. So I'm in the process of creating that and it will go with the book. Uh, that's that's great. That's um, mm. uh, you, You'll be one of those giants that people are standing on the shoulders of <laughs> you know, <laughs> Amelia Earhart, Amelia Formby, you know, be mentioned in the in in, in the same breath, Millie. Ah, look, thanks. It's um, it's been a a, a great uh, a great pleasure to meet you. Um, I'm really excited for your journey. Um, makes Thank me you. makes me want to bring my little uh, not quite so lofty uh, project to uh, to bear. I, I I want to do an e-bike expedition to uh, and, and basically calling in on uh, yeah. on schools and and doing yeah. trivia nights and public meetings and whatnot. But but hey, I got to get the crowdfunding thing together for that too. Yeah. So because it's yeah, pretty expensive it. to go fun. places. It can be yeah. Well, the most expensive thing is actually going places and having to stay places. Yeah, that's, it is. <laughs> that's the most yeah, expensive thing. For my yeah. 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 So, yeah. Um, great. It's it's going to be uh, it's going to be a joy following you around, Millie. Um, and and 
you know, who knows? Maybe a Great Eastern Curlew will will meet you and accompany mm-hmm. accompany you on uh, on uh, on a couple of uh, a couple of hundred k's. Yeah, that be amazing? It would be. It would be. <laughs> <laughs> Millie Formby, wing threads. Wing threads is what you need to look up and go to chuffed.org and hit that uh, that donation button. We'll just see whether anything's happened in the last couple of minutes because <laughs> I love doing this. You've become a compulsive chuffed checker. No, no. Well, I, I will be checking regularly and, <laughs> <You'll> be. <laughs> uh, and, and maybe... Maybe driving people mad on Twitter. Yeah, uh, maybe. Do it. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Thanks, Millie. Um, Grant, this has been, this has been the Bird Emergency. I'm Grant Williams. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for putting your comments in. Uh, it's always fun when people are joining in and we can uh, make the conversation a bit more exciting than just me. <laughs> Thanks, Millie. Love Thank you. you. Bye-bye, everyone. <laughs> Well, there we go. That was um, that was great. I um, I really, really enjoyed talking to Millie. Um, I'm looking forward to catching up with her. Um, well, once the January silly season is out of the way, uh, I want to get uh, Millie back, and I want to try and get. Millie and Costa back at the same time so that um, because Costa and and Millie have been doing live streams and and catch-ups along along the way so um, really good that Costa's been putting the uh, resources um, available in um, from Gardening Australia and the ABC behind it and Costa's own uh, own thing. So, yeah, great, great stuff. Oh, wow, I've got a thousand, um, thousand messages while um, on Twitter there. Okay, now, before we get into the, the next one, I'm just going to... Um, yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Sam. In in uh, Millie um, epitomizes why I always say that bird nerds are the best nerds, right? Um, and and why I'm a cynic about you know Bill Gates and and what's his name Jeff Bezos uh, are going to give away their fortune, right? They're going to give away most of their fortune. Yeah, when they're eighty or something, what? Why not do it now? Why not get behind? Well, you know, what? What's the point of holding on to all the billions? Hold on to one billion for yourself and for your family, and then share it around. But this idea they're going to give it away. No, what they want is the control, so that the people that they they choose to support, they can use them and direct them, and that annoys me so um yeah um now i'm going to put the starting soon thing up and so there and um oh the other question i wanted to ask you naomi you can tell me this when someone puts something in the comments from the other platforms are you seeing it like are you seeing some of the crap that comes in from uh from twitch and and from and the youtube one that i had to I had to ban do you see that in in the comment feed that you see like is it all combined at your end um so just let me know and i will be back on i'll make a be back soon um thing shortly actually why don't i just take that down and um i'll actually get and i'll get the other one up one eye and we'll get that ready so it looks like it's ready to go um take me a minute or two but i'll have to have a way and make a coffee that would be good wouldn't it 
Um, and I hope you, uh, I hope you learned something in that too. Like Millie told us so much about so many things in that. Um, <laughs> uh, that's that's good. Um, I I've been trying to get um someone who's actually a big donor on the show. Like, there's actually groups that pull that get donor money. Like, they know a whole bunch of rich people. And they they start a foundation. They get donations from people and can offer them tax deducti deductibility. And then they will choose which projects they're going to um, uh, support. Um, it's it means you can get more. Um, More money from, um, sorry, just seeing this takes a while. Um, uh, da, 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 da. yeah, so what are we doing live? I'm looking for the one with just me and Daryl, not me and Daryl and um, uh, and Holly. So bear with me, Daryl Jones. There we are. That's the one we want. July, July this year, I spoke with Daryl. Um, open a new tab. Then we can. It was definitely twi uh, that streaming to Twitter that was causing that um, buffering issues and everything earlier today. So that obviously, I used to stream to Twitch all the time year, a couple of years back or a year, or, yeah, maybe a couple of years back and it didn't have all those problems. So Elon's certainly stuffed that up. So good on him. Um, okay, so we've got Daryl. That's good. Found that, kill that, um, and I'll get that one ready. Share that, Chrome there, that one. Share. And if I go to, if I go to, There and if I just make another little banner, saying um, Add banner. There we are. I'm sure. Um, I'm sure people from all around the world know what Lou means. Okay, I will be back uh, shortly. Fill up my water bottle and get a coffee happening. See you in a little while. Actually, while we're waiting, why don't I put the music on for you? That might be good. Where's Feeding the Ducks? Where's Feeding the Ducks? Here we are. There we are.
There we go, that was uh, cool, nice, better check my messages and everything while we're at it, um, Right, sorry, just checking my messages to make sure there was nothing extremely amazing there. So we turn that off and um, uh, take me banner down. Um, so, are you ready to meet 
Daryl Jones. Hooray! Um, tell me, how, had, had you heard about Daryl before? That would that'd be good to know. Aren't you glad that I've changed up the backgrounds and, um, well, I was a bit thinner in, in that one, but what were we looking at earlier today? Um, do you notice, let me put this one up. Do you notice how much less of my face there is than there was um, back then? Um, yeah, I might talk about... I might talk about my weight loss journey um, one day, and and I've been thinking about whether I should um, I should play the interviews that I did basically with. I used to do a podcast about migrating to Australia with a immigration lawyer, and. We we didn't do video not until not until the the pandemic but um, in in that time I found out I had cancer and I had to have an an operation a couple of days after I was told um, and and before the operation my surgeon told me that I I was less than a fifty percent chance to survive the operation. So so I had about I think it was four days. I had about four days to um <laughs> to uh, to sort of think about what well I just had four days to work out what I <laughs> um yeah what I was gonna do. Anyway, after um no, j j just before we went in, uh, just before I went in for the uh, for the surgery, I I think I did uh, an episode of that podcast with David and talked about it, and then uh, and and then we did we did an episode when I wasn't dead, <laughs> and I I wonder uh, uh, I do have another YouTube channel. Um, that I don't do anything with. It's just where I watch YouTube so that all the videos don't pop up whenever I'm on this channel. Um, and I just wonder whether 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 that would be something you'd be interested in one one day when I'm just streaming and that can be a, like a time filler um, if you wanted to get to know me more uh, because... <laughs> Because that was pretty raw. That was a pretty raw um, conversation. Um, yeah. Anyway, that's uh, that's that. We're talking birds again. Um, let's get Daryl on full screen. Get that up a bit bigger. There we are. And let's... Um, sorry you have to listen to me introducing again each time. But let's... Uh, Let's just go with it. If if the levels are too loud or, or anything or not loud enough, let me know in the comments too. Okay, and I'll be here. I'll just be drinking my coffee. Hello, bird nerds. Oh, it's it's the loud. bird emergency. I'm Grant Williams. I am a bird nerd, and I have special skills, as I've just clearly demonstrated, in not a whole lot. I'm today speaking with. Another scientist, but a scientist who is now a full-time author, which is pretty bloody cool, I reckon. Former Queenslander, now denizen of Malaysia, and uh, we've just had a nice little chat about flying into Malaysia. Daryl Jones, how are you? You know, Grant, I'm, I'm brilliant, mate. It's fantastic to be on the show. Well, um, very fortuitous that I, I saw a tweet that popped up um, with the intriguing uh, hook, uh, Corvus urbanus. Mm. And I thought, mm. that's not one I know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that one. I will read further. And then uh, I discovered that it's uh, an idea, a, a treatise, shall we say, mm. 
that you've um, been working on for a little while. I didn't know that this was had been a hobby horse of yours for um, what six years or so. Set, well, you've had to write it, so it's probably been eight to ten years that you've been yeah, thinking yeah. about this. That's right, absolutely. That urban birds yep, are yep. speciating. They are evolving before our very eyes before to possibly become eyes. new species. Mm, mm. And you, yep. would, you, you did your study on a crow, but I think we can overlay this to a heap of birds. In the Australian context, context no better example than the white ibis, the bin sure. chicken, I would say. Sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. How did, yes, you, how did you get interested in this whole idea? I've been an urban ecologist my entire career. In fact, I did my honours several centuries ago on birds in a, in a small country town, my, my home country town of Wagga Wagga. Uh, and it was, as far as I know, it was the first study, you know, a serious but limited small amount, small study on just birds in a city somewhere in Australia. So it was the, you know, very early version, er, example of urban ecology here in this place. So, but I've been doing that sort of stuff and plenty of other things as well for a long time but i'm really interested in why some species i mean most most animals can't cope with what we do when we turn the bush or 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 a farm into a suburb we just they just can't cope they can't cope with the change that's so pronounced and so profound and they just leave or die but there's a small number and they're the ones that i'm really interested in of which birds that come back on their own terms and do bloody well, you know. They 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 thrive on what we throw at them somehow, and uh, yeah. And the and the crow is a is a special example of, of what's going on there. So in in the Australian context, um, the birds that first spring to mind when we talk about the birds that love to live alongside us yep. are generally introduced birds. Yep. Um, it, it, in recent times, the rainbow lorikeet has probably become a a really familiar part of our suburbs. But when I was a child, they weren't common in the in no. the cities. No. Um, the magpie lark, or the mud pa, mud lark, or the peewee, whatever you want to call it, and yep. the Australian magpie, white backed magpie, in my. Mm. Uh, uh, experience and the mask lapwing or the spurwing plover were the common native birds mm. that would mm. exist alongside the Indian miner or the common miner as it's known on the on the Asian continent and the sparrows and the starling and the and the European blackbird. Sure. Um, we're of a similar vintage. Was your yep. experience of the birds that you knew in your suburbs similar to mine? Absolutely. Now, don't forget, I come from the, the bush. I was in a, you know, a, a smallish country town. In Wagga, yeah. In Wagga. And in fact, the new book, which we will flog as hard as we can on this show, Curlews on in Vulture Street, <laughs> um, that's, that opens with me as a 14-year-old. Sorry, um, don't don't stop when I put up a a, 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 a picture. Uh, I was just um, I was just saying, there we are. We 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 are going to be flogging books, all right? Okay, <laughs> so, yeah, of course, just so people get that clear. No, but this this book that's coming out, which isn't the one that just came up here, there, Curlew's in Adult Street. It starts with me as a fourteen-year-old seeing a blackbird on my backyard, and I think a blackbird in Wagga, that, that, that's beyond comprehension. And I was, I had, as I said, I went on and did honours on the birds that lived in my country town. And that was, as, as you say, starlings, sparrows, um, not blackbirds at that stage, they hadn't arrived. Tree sparrows were there, goldfinches, greenfinches, they were all there. And they were the dominant types of birds. And there was only a small number of really abundant, uh, you know, native birds which were there at all. And there was certainly no rainbow lorikeets. And, and in the last couple of decades, the rainbow lorikeet has become the commonest city bird in, the, in Australia. It's every, everywhere, you know, along with noisy miners. And so what's the commonality there? Nectar, be, nectar feeding, you know. And so we put in billions of nectar-bearing plants in our gardens and parks and everywhere. And 
some nectar bearing nectar feeding birds have said brilliant that's just what we want let's go for it and they've they've really prospered yeah i i know that uh you know that i rushed out um a recording that i'd i'd done with holly um uh, and uh, Johanna Martin's a little while about uh, about feeding wild birds. Right. Um, now you wrote a book called "The Birds at My Table," which mm. I've been talking, about, uh, been flogging a bit on on Twitter. Um, do you have a view about feeding wild birds in localities that are? Um, not really, really, really urbanised. So we could be talking about country towns and the fringe suburbs of our major cities. I have a very strong opinion about all those sorts of things. Expressed, okay, hit us. <laughs> now expressed most articulately and in detail in, this, in the follow-up book to the birds at my table, which is feeding the birds at your table, which is a guide for feeding birds in Australia. There, I've said it. I've said it. Feeding birds in Australia, is that even a possibility? This is the only place in the world where the mere suggestion of feeding native birds or any birds in your own backyard is is anathema. You know, it's, it's the opposite of what's supposed to be happening. We were all told. So I've, I've had to re, readjust my thinking about that. I was the, in the string them up as high as we can category of um, anybody that fed birds my whole life until I started looking into it. And what I've discovered is that there's so many people feeding birds, so many people feeding birds. So such a huge proportion. It's around about 20 to 35% of every household in Australia, people are spending money on feeding birds in their backyards. And they're not going to stop. They're not going to stop. No. So did, did, did you... Did you listen to what we were, what we were saying, and where we got to in our um, yeah I, I did. Uh, in our conversation? I did. Remind me of what your what your conclusion well, it, was. Well, the the conclusion really was that um, there are better ways to look after the birds that are around, and that in a lot of cases the birds that are around don't need to be fed. And that if you are supplementary feeding in the wrong way, such as how I was doing it, just putting out a commercial seed mix, yeah. that you can be introducing birds in, into a location in a number which is far greater than they would otherwise be, which mm. can then drive other birds, other birds out. So that was one thing. The other thing was that depending on how you're feeding you can be helping to tra to be uh, you're an aid to the transmission of diseases which are really bad for the birds that you are trying to help yep. and we talked about beak and feather disease yep. um because it was prior to the horrible avian influenza outbreak that a lot of the world is dealing with at the moment so mm -hmm. Uh, and the context of that discussion, if you haven't uh, heard it, people, just search to feed or not to feed with the bird emergency and you'll get it, uh, the video or the, uh, or the podcast. Um, it was during the pandemic that I live across the road from a park and I mm. live in a unit. So I don't right. have a garden where birds come in and mm. feed on my, my grevilleas or my mm. bottle brush or whatever. So I was feeding the parrots, the, well. the cockatoos, the corellas, um, the red rumps and, and okay. whatnot. Uh, and in my area, the lorikeets aren't habituated to come down to the ground to be fed. Mm. So so yeah. so they weren't they weren't involved, but it was a big flock of long bill corellas now since i've stopped feeding them they've stopped coming to this park every day yeah, but they're yeah. still around yeah they yeah. don't need me to feed them that was really really yeah. the the kind of point so Absolutely. um I'll, 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 I'll go here before we press go i asked you about the cover of your book mm. and 
it's one of the reasons why I'd never bought the book. <laughs> but it ties in to, to the difference that we have in Australia, and I think yep. you were alluding to, compared to Northern Hemisphere, yep. where feeding takes place in a different way, mm. also with different things. I mean, suet balls are a thing, right? Yeah. Yep. Um, yep. Yep. And that in those highly urbanised settings in the UK, the US, Europe, um, uh, Canada, obviously, where urbanisation is taking habitat away and feeding opportunities and where the bulk of the birds are migrating, those feeders are essential uh, life-giving oases in the desert for these migratory species. So I think that's one of the reasons why the attitudes are substantially different. Yeah. What well, do you think about about that idea? No, absolutely. So that's there, there is a really, and in fact, I've written a, a paper about the contrast between the northern and southern hemispheres on this very very thing. I'll find, I'll, I'll send you that paper and, and we can broadcast it around a bit. But there's a really big difference. The, the primary difference is those countries you just mentioned have terrible winters, really difficult places where birds, if they can possibly get out of there, they do and they leave and they, you know, they migrate to a sensible place where they can survive the winter. And then they come back when the conditions are, you know, are a bit better in spring and breed back where they normally came from. But that's the birds that are left behind, which were the first birds that people started feeding because they, it was, it was primarily a humane gesture of poor starving birds on the, you know, the, the, the you know, the, the windowsill covered in in snow you know it was difficult times and so what you what could you how could you help them out but that's changed things really radically i mean probably the most ex radical example is ruby-throated hummingbirds now over winter in in vancouver because people have put out feeders in this case a sugar feeder type thing a nectar type apparatus that now has a heater in it so it wasn't won't freeze so you've got hummingbirds in the snow, insane, completely ridiculous. And that's just one example of birds that have stopped migrating because they don't need to. They don't. They, there's plenty of food for them, it seems, back in the wintry places, and they don't leave and go back somewhere else. And and there could be another aspect to that too, is that um, maybe as the climate is changing, maybe the the migration that they undertake is actually too harrowing for right. them and that and that where they used to go to to get refuse refuge from the uh, bitterly cold winters may be becoming too hot maybe not the final destination but maybe the places that they are moving through have yeah. become uh, 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 nutrition deserts for them who knows? So maybe sure, it's sure. actually a, a coping mechanism that is a very smart one for those birds. Well, I mean, there, there is an adaptive element to that for sure. And, and the, winters, the winters are getting less severe, so there's less push, if you like. Hmm. Um, and so there is a bunch of species, especially in Europe, which where they've been studied a bit more. The black throat is, no, the back, black cap is one of them which no longer does the big migration down into Spain and North, North Africa. Lots of them now just stay in Europe because it's not so cold. Plus, there's tons of food available for them for the people who, by the people who are putting them out. So that's, that's the very North America, North, Northern Hemisphere perspective. Let's go back to the, story, the questions you asked can, originally. Can I, can I just stop you there? Hold that sure. thought. The bird watcher in me... Yep. says, oh, those birds sticking around, that's great. But mm. they're... creatures don't exist in isolation. So there may well be vegetation communities that need those birds to pass through. Pest control, pest management, mm. Mm. be it for people or for um, ecosystems, yep. may need those birds to pass through. Sure. Raptors in different areas and other predators may need those birds to pass through. Yeah. So the point is, we can't look at any of these things in isolation. And we need to be um, cautious about being either critics or, 
cheer squad members for any of these uh, changes and the actions that people are, are, are taking. Absolutely. Um, yeah. I mean, it's I, my, my take is every, if you're feeding birds, you think it's just my backyard. It's not a big drama. But when you think about that three or four of the ten houses in your street, it's probably happening as well. Then it becomes this ecological experiment on a global scale. It's absolutely massive. The, purport, the, the amount of food that's put out in the Northern Hemisphere especially is utterly un... It's impossible to comprehend how much there is. It's just... It's, it's enormous. And yet all of it is eaten. You know, all of it gets eaten. A lot of fat sparrows. impact on, on all sorts of things. You know, <laughs> fat buntings. No that's really what that book, the, bird, the Birds at My Table, was trying to get at. It was... You know, I'm, I might be repeating the birds at my bird table just in my backyard. I don't think about it beyond that. But on a global scale, the ecological impacts and implications are massive. And that's what that book explores. It looks at the whole global side of things. Now, before we um, move on, let, let me do the ad, the ad for you. Um, that is the Australian version of... The birds at my table which you call feeding the birds at my table now that's still available and in print isn't well, yeah, it absolutely. Uh, that's, that's um that sold extremely well absolutely and thinking about you know we we talked about before we went on on the air the inappropriate species that were put on the cover of the blue book which is the the birds at my table you know pigeons and and a raven and a crazy stuff that never goes and a, and, and a european magpie and a european magpie absolutely um, I don't think there's going to be a huge number of bird feeders in Australia that, that get a pink cockatoo on their, a Major Mitchell on their, on their feeder. And that's on the cover of that book. But that's all, that's about marketing, not about, re, um, you know, reality. Um, but isn't that interesting that, um, why wouldn't they have picked a lorikeet or a king parrot, you know? They just had a nice, <laughs> a nice picture. It's the marketing people just took over at that stage, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but um, but well, originally it was going to be a self crested and I went, "You must not put a self crested <laughs> <That's laughs> right. No way! No, and they said, "What's the problem?" You know, so they soon learned that there was a big problem. Yeah, uh, let, let's do a bit more marketing uh, on for this book. Um, is there a code or anything like that? Is there any way someone can snag a uh, a discount at uh, New South Books, isn't it? That are selling New that South one. Books, yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah. well, it's it's available pretty much everywhere. Um, I suspect there's going to be a, a deal done. They haven't announced it formally, but I suspect there'll be a deal done when the new book comes out because it's special. It's the, this book, yes, this one, Curlews. So we've got a nice pink and a nice blue. Um, there'll probably be a deal done to get both of them at the same time. I suspect. Um, so keep your eyes out. I, I always advocate going to the book, the um, publishers to buy your books. If you can't, go to the local bookshop. Yep. Go to the book, local bookshop first, but, you know, this is where you go second. Um, you, you know that the pedants are going to be throwing rocks at me now, saying, that's not a curlew. That's a thick me. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a specific provocation that I want people to notice if that's the case. In the first sentence in the book, I say, it's actually a stone curlew. And so, that's you know, right. <laughs> no, but that's if it's, right. if it's, 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 there's no, you know, any publicity is good publicity, basically. Yeah. That's, uh, uh, that's correct. That's correct. So, um, good. I'm glad we got the ad out of the way. Your publishers can be happy and they can put me on their mailing list to review any future books that would be really nice because i'd love to do it um but no i cannot possibly afford to go and buy all the new books i would like to talk about i reckon i can talk them into sending you a copy of that one that's for sure uh that would that would be fab because i mean this is what it's all about we want to share yeah, the good stuff's out there that's yeah. out there and steer people towards the good stuff so that they don't buy the crap that's on the discount tables uh, when, when, they, when they go shopping. Yep. Okay, let's get back to this idea of urbanisation. Now, I read, I read the paper from, what was it, 2016, 
and I had a bit of a giggle because uh, in the uh, in the introduction, right at the start when we're talking about what corvids are, you said they're a clade, which mm. made me g- giggle because um, Maggie Watson in an earlier episode had talked about a cline, right? And and people have said to me, "What's a cline?" Well, here's my first question: though. What's a clade? <laughs> Put okay. your put your ecology professor hat yeah. on here. <laughs> I know, absolutely. Now it's 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 some it's trying to get across the idea that there would have been an original corvid, a black crowish look, looking bird that's diverged into a, into five separate species in in this continent, and that they're all closely related. So it's a, it's it the implication of clade is closely related. They're not. None of them are that different, different from each other. They would have split only not that long ago, you know. So there's hardly any difference between them. Now, for talking about um, corvids, and you just limited it to Australia, but I want to sort of broaden it sure. out a little bit for the, for all of our um, audience. Crows and ravens are pretty are pretty similar. They're in yep. they're in the same evolutionary branch. Yep. In Australia, we've got currawongs. Yep. How close are they to? They're not. They're not that close. So currawongs. Okay. So you, let's go with currawongs and butcher birds. They're, they're yes. the two big groups. So they yep. they those two, the butcher birds, and the currawongs are very closely related. They're not that close to the to the crows. They're, that's they're not that close at all. And, and in fact, you now, and I'm, where, where does the magpie come in? Well, the magpie these days is just the big butcher bird. It's just the biggest the bi- butcher bird. Okay. Because okay. yeah. uh, that was my next question. Where, yeah. where are we putting the Australian well, magpie? So the magpie is a butcher bird. It's just straight okay. down the line, every, all, the, yeah. all the things. It's, a, it's one of those butcher, bird, butcher birds. And the currawong is closely related to it. So they're very, very similar. But they're not, despite appearances, they're not. Evolutionarily, that close at all? You know, they're, they're really quite different. Um, okay, uh, let let me. Uh, uh, sorry to always do this, but um, where do the currawongs fit if they're not that closely related to? Uh, Were well, you saying they're not that closely related to the corvids, true corvids, corvids. or are they not that closely related to magpies and butcher birds? No, no, the they're very Australian closely related state. to the butcher birds. That group, you know, that big, big, um, very Australian group, but they're but neither of those two, so they're they're you know, they're sister groups way over to here, they're fairly distant from all the corvids. And we okay. probably and should then go corvids, okay? So in Australia, we've got crows and ravens, and we don't think yeah. much more, but elsewhere in the world, as far such, such as where I'm at the moment here in, in Kuala Lumpur, there's all sorts of other corvids, and in well, Europe, the... there, there are jackdaws and there are yeah. right bays and all sorts of. Let's get there in just a minute. Sure, the, sure. the next question, uh, based on that evolutionary uh, treatise that, we, that we've just given, um, given the theory that songbirds, and that's loosely passerines, originated in Australia, yep. does that, uh, which, which is older, the butcher bird, magpie, currawong, uh, lineage or the corvid lineage? No, the butcher birds, for sure, absolutely. Okay, they're, they're, okay. they're fundamental as Auss- Aussie, you know, or Gondwanan, really. You know, not so much okay, so, yeah. so the rest of the world can thank our amazing Quite. magpies and 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 quirky currawongs yep. for the joys of the other corvids, the jays. The European magpies, and and all of those birds. Yes, they well, split. actually, they can't thank us. They can, if no. they're going to thank anyone, they can thank the uh, the the original Australians. Quite uh, so. Yeah, it's Nadoc Week too, by the way. Happy Nadoc Week, everyone. Yep, that's right. That's right. Yeah. So, and in and in fact, we and we can personally thank thank Tim Lowe for bringing this together in his yes. wonderful book, um, the, the song. Where song began, which is all about that that very topic, yeah. and that's yeah. that has been sticking in the craw of many people in the northern hemisphere who always assumed that all good things, cultural and otherwise, came from Europe, 
and this is turning that completely on its head. But uh, get out I, I interviewed David Tan, who's a right. Singapore native, right. who is studying um, ornithology in uh, where is he in in Nevada or Arizona? Yeah. I think he's in. I think he's in Arizona, um, but his special interest group is pitters and we were talking about migratory birds yeah. and because he was a northern hemisphere guy i thought i'd ask him well you know what's older where did they all come from and he just said gondwanas australia that's where it all all began you know? <laughs> all right. fair enough good idea um but it's amazing how rarely when i speak to bird nerds ornithologists uh, and ecologists from the northern hemisphere where they have flipped their perspective around about where uh, where things sort of originated yeah non passerines did they also evolve here or, or like I know it's off the track, so if you if you are watching and listening for this, sorry, but I can't I can't let the opportunity go while I've got Daryl here and we're tuned in on this. Do you reckon? I mean, did birds evolve in Gond Gondwana or uh, what was the the pre Gondwana grouping of the continents lower, lower down here? Yeah, or, no. or 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 is there a, a was there simultaneous evolution happening from different branches of dinosaurs? There's a huge question there, you know, way beyond my... my well, opinion. God, what do you think? <laughs> no, I can, what I can say is the passerines, the songbird, perching birds, little birds, bush birds that we often think about, and probably the magpie is about the biggest one there is, but, you know, all those little songy birds are beautiful things that sing nicely and all that sort of stuff. They're the passerines... That's just one group. Uh, we, along with the passerines, there are, I think we're up to 14 different other groups. You know, the, the, the birds of prey, the ducks, the, you know, everything else is also in big groups. And so it's impossible and probably not even sensible to say where did they all originate because they originated everywhere. Everywhere. You know? so, yeah. <laughs> so a good example of a non-passerine bird that did ex originate in Gondwana slash Australia, the southern continent, is the, is the ratites, the emus and the rail, and, um, and uh, all, um, all of those, they originated in that part as well. Now, is it, does that include the rails? Because are, are the rails outside of Gallinules nowadays? Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. Okay. Yeah, and they're ancient. Now, I haven't got a clue where, where they come from. They're very old. They're very, very old. Um, Mate, we we are getting so meta here. <laughs> I know. So there's, there's going to be some actual evolutionary biologists out there shaking their head and thinking, who the hell are these guys? You know? Yeah, who are these clowns? Well, our names are down there. That's who these clowns are. So it's not hard to do. I'm expecting plenty of emails after this. All right. Now, I, uh, I want to come back on to a definition that I was reading in that paper, which can probably get us way off into the weeds again uh neophobic oh, i knew it'd be that yeah. functional and intrinsic right neophobia just means fear of new anything that's new fear of the um, new fear okay. of the new and, absolutely in fact there are plenty of people you could say are neophobic for sure all right I'll, now um, i'll put it in context for the people yeah. who have who, who have just joined in you were talking about how um, the crows that you were studying, and they were the Tarasian crows, yep. um, uh, reacted to something new being introduced into their environment, like a twig, which is what it, mm. you, you were talking about. So, how did you how did you test this? I mean, to save people reading the article, you did sixty five tests. There were control tests. Um, background test, novel tests. Tell us how you tested how a crow reacts to a, a something new in yep. their environment. 
Well, okay. So this was a uh, this was um, Matt Brown. He did his PhD on these crows. So the the crows that we studied were the ones that lived on the campus at Griffith University in the middle of Brisbane, which is a fantastic place to study them. But like crows everywhere, they're unbelievably difficult to catch or anything like that. So we were he was particularly interested in their cognitive abilities, how if you like, how smart they are, what do they you know, how do they learn, all that kind of stuff. Because this is part of their success story. They're one of these big brained birds that learn quickly, have very good adaptations to change and all that sort of thing. But if you compare a magpie and a, and, a, and a crow, a magpie will just go bowling straight in, get whatever it is and fly away or, or get killed in the process. A crow would never do that. The crow will see something different, think, is this an opportunity that I can benefit from? I'm going to just watch a bit. I'll watch especially if some other donkey bird goes in and, and goes there first. Oh, no, they got into a bit of trouble. I'm not going anywhere near. I'll just keep watching. They are risk-averse but they're learning all the time and they're always thinking about what, what they can get out of something if there's something to be got out. And that's really the, one of the secrets for their success. So we had trained, if you like, these crows to come down eventually to get a, just a, a little ball of mints and they became really used to, we put out the ball of mints in a certain location. We did this with all the different, seven different pairs that lived on the campus and they all eventually got used to seeing us arrive and we'd put down the ball of mints and that was fine. They, got a nice little snack out of that. And then what we did was we put something completely different and utterly benign, not a, not a rabbit trap or a, you know, something garish and possibly dangerous. We got some um, blue tack and put some twigs in it and just, it was just a strange looking thing. But twigs are everywhere. There's nothing special about twigs. It was just a slightly different arrangement of twigs. No animal in the world would think that there was a risk there. Crows did. They just went, what is that strange thing over there near my beautiful ball of mints? I'm not going anywhere near it. And they, so that's, if you like, you know, the, the simplified version of what's going on. How long did it take them to, they would, they would approach, we would say, when they got within a certain distance from the bait, we would then record how long it took them to do things. And so, so we, if you like, quantified their neophobia, their fear of this new thing, by how long, it, how long it took them to go to the mints without the new thing there. And then we changed how many different new things there were. And some new things they would never got used to. They did eventually get used to the twigs. I think that twig hasn't moved for four days. Maybe it's safe after all. You know, that's how crazy they were. And so, we, so that's how we did it, effectively. How long did it take them to get used to this new thing? Did, did you discover amongst that population, and it's, it's small... Yeah. Okay, so it's difficult to um, extrapolate further. But were there were there bolder individuals? Were yes. there more yeah. inquisitive individuals within yeah. that small population? Definitely. And the the problem was we always speculated they looked a bit sleeker, they looked a bit brighter of eye, that they just looked a bit younger. But we would never know because you once they get to about two, and their eyes change to their their final colour, you cannot tell how old they are. And, and we couldn't catch them. And we, in fact, we had decided that we weren't going to catch them. I've done, I've been working with crows for 30 years. As soon as you catch them, the trauma of being caught to ban them means that you'll never be able to go anywhere near those crows ever again. They'll, they'll recognise you. It's, they're, they're out of the system for, for good. And that's really frustrating for an animal behaviour person. Absolutely. Yeah. But it, it, it's interesting that you, that you mentioned that they recognise you. Um, oh, yeah. I've got a local. I've got a local pair of magpies that nest in the tree directly across right. from my house, and they swoop most men. Right. They do not swoop me. Okay. Okay. Um, they do not swoop the postie. They do not swoop me when I walk the dog, but they do swoop the guy two houses down when he walks his dog, and they don't just swoop him. They they want to eradicate him from the face of the planet. <laughs> they know who he is and oh, they yeah. know who I am and they, yeah. and they can tell the dog, you know. Yeah. Um, so this idea that, that, that birds all react in the same way to the, the same thing is just weird. 
Yeah, um, no, it, it it's, um, doesn't give them the credit they deserve. Magpies, we've done a lot of work on this. We've actually proven that they can remember by their facial features because we wore masks and changed masks around and all that sort of thing. They can remember people's faces. That's how, like we do, you know, by the arrangement of our nose and our eyes and all that sort of stuff. And they look, they, that's, they can look at a person's face and say, I know you. But also, don't forget that the magpies that live across the street from you don't have a big range. They would see the same no. people mostly every day. And, and so they might live for 20 years. They would see kids grow up. They would see the same people going, coming and going all day long. They'd know you. They'd know the bloke down the road. Mm. They'd know who a stranger was as well if they came wandering through as well. Mm. So they know those people very well. And so and they don't move. If, it, if it's all stable and nothing, there's no reason to move, those magpies will never move from that spot. So they know us intimately, you know. Yeah. And so if they say, take a... A, a, a decide, if they decide that you're a danger for some reason unknown only for themselves, then you're buggered because that bloke down the road probably ever, you know, as long as those magpies are still there, they're going to hammer him forever. And that's, yes, that. that's, that's a hard thing to tell them. <laughs> and um, it, it makes me wonder what he, whether he ever did anything to provoke them because yeah. I'm, I'm always amazed that people will throw things at a bird like a magpie. Or, or a lapwing, a, a spurwing yeah. plover, or anything like that. I think you, you're dicing with death. You, you're asking for trouble. And in fact, with magpies, and if you live near them, or they, you go to that place regularly, they're pretty much going to remember you for the rest of their lives. You know, you've, you've, you've made a real rod for your back if you do something nasty to a magpie, because they will remember. And it doesn't take, there's actually a, a, a really interesting anecdote that we are relate in that Curlew's book, which you've shown about one of my research assistants who got who got um recognized yep in there there's a there's a chapter on magpies the magpies on shottery street is the name of the chapter um and those magpies remembered nick salento who was my research assistant for years and years they remembered him 15 years after the first incident and all he did was we actually said he said to me one day I reckon we could make a, 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 a peaceful magpie into a, an aggressive one. I went, what do you want to do that for? And he said, well, some, not all magpies, you know, the majority of magpies are never aggressive. 90% never attack anybody. We have to remember that. That's really so something changes in their behaviour. And they're smart birds, so they, they know what's going on. So all he did, this was just one mild experiment. All he did was go to a tree where we knew there was magpies. We knew the magpies had never attacked anybody. But there were chicks in the nest. And all he did was walk around the tree five times, looking up at the nest, yeah, behaving, yeah. I guess, like a predator, like a cat, the, <laughs> like a cat or a, or a goanna. We've seen a goanna in the area. Yep. And from that, only five trials, and he didn't even do anything. After that, they remembered him for the rest of his life. Those mm -hmm. So they're smart, and they've got an amazing memory. Uh, Nick, I hope you're able to move away. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, and um, get some peace. He, he, he's, he's worked out how to do that. Yeah. <laughs> and don't become a postie would be my <laughs> advice, Nick. That's right, absolutely. <laughs> um, so, all right, you, you, you've got to know intimately these this population of, of crows and you've done these experiments. What did that, how did that experience that experiment lead you to this theory? Have we advanced it far enough to become a theory that um, that yeah, yeah. urban birds are evolving into species? Is it an yeah. idea or is it a theory? No, it's still it's still a hypothesis, I guess, more than a theory. Um, there is a great book on this stuff, and it's not just about birds, it's about all sorts of animals that live in cities, called Darwin Comes to Town by a bloke with an unpronounceable German name. But you can look it up, just Darwin Comes to Town, Google that. And he's got he's collated as many many examples as you possibly can. But the ones that I, I got to know this, because I'm an urban ecologist, I keep an eye on those sorts of um, papers. And, you know, as well as the changing of... Most of the, it comes back to bird feeding in some, some senses because that's a big thing that humans do and have changed the environment, putting food out for birds. There's now extremely good evidence that great tits, the, the birds, um, have got smaller and finer beaks so they can get the seeds out of the feeders 
more efficiently than the birds that don't have the they have a fatter beak. And so they're getting more food and therefore more nutrition from the feeders. And that's changed only in about 30 years. And that's one example of many, many other examples where there's, where there's been, uh, I guess, physiological changes, you know, phys physical changes that you can measure quickly in these sorts of things. So that was the background. I was becoming more and more aware of these, uh, what was going on with urbanised birds and the ones that were living in the city. And you very rightly named the bin chicken, the white, white ibis. There is now a profoundly urbanised inner city ibis, which hang out in the CBDs and the inner city places, especially in places like the Gold Coast and Brisbane and Sydney, where they, they behave in a very different way. We looked at how many ways they feed, how many times they, in the different ways they use their beaks. And those birds can use, have thir up to 35 different ways of feeding that a bird in the bush or out on the mudflats would never have to use. You know, a bird on the mudflats never has to pick up a half-eaten hamburger and, and scoff it or, or, or steal chips from a, from a toddler. These are all new things that they've come up with. Daryl, you grew up in the country town. I grew up in the country as well. I'm assuming that you've been on the Saturday or Sunday morning uh, trip to the tip with the trailer. I don't think that this behaviour with ibis, straw-necked ibis and white ibis, is that new. Oh, no, I was I, I was watching it in the in the tip yeah. uh, that I went to as a kid, way before I ever saw saw it in the city. Um, I, I wonder what came first. I reckon we've displaced the ibises. From, from all the places where they were happily uh, feeding in uh, on on the fringes of dams and lakes and rivers and and in wet paddocks eating crickets and everything, right. doing what they do, yep. and going and having their treat at the municipal tip. Yep. I reckon we pushed them all out, and then they've adapted what they learnt in the tips into the city. Discuss. Discuss, okay. Um, <laughs> that doesn't seem to be the case, but it, what it does suggest to you is that intrinsically, intrinsically, white ibis, common, common Australian white ibis, are very adapted. At, at, they're, they're smart. You know, they're, they're innovative. They'll come up with new ways. So, so, yes, sticking a beak into a tip is totally different from sticking it into a mudflat or, or chasing grasshoppers in the, in the grasslands, definitely. Um, so they've got that intrinsic ability to change and adapt and, you know, use their use beaks in different ways. What's interesting to me is that you never see the straw neck divers, their close relative, ever doing anything like that. But you'd never see a straw neck divers on the tip. I, well, I used to. That was did why you? I referenced oh, them. Absolutely. Oh, and, well, that's and, new to me. That's new to me. Okay. And, and um, that was so that, exactly I, why I referenced them. Well, that's interesting uh, because they haven't really become inner urbanized that that's it and and this is what got me thinking about it is that um we there's still places that um i uh, i saw straw necked ibises as a kid that i still see them but the, the white ibis seem to have gone like that then oh. they they would have been the more numerous right uh, when I was a kid, but they're no longer okay. Uh, okay. the most numerous. So, yeah. um, so that that that's what sort of got me interested in this idea of why did the bin chicken become a bin chicken? All right, um, let me let me tell you. This is my this is a, a very 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 important part of urban ecology. I think if you're going to there it is. Pronounce that surname for me. Uh, Schultheisen. Oh, uh, Schultheisen. There we go. There we go. Me Menno Schultheisen. Um, yeah. So Magic. The... Magic how that happened. <laughs> no, what I was going to say was... Um, what, what were we talking about? Um, Straw-necked ibis, Straw white ibis. ibis. Absolutely. So the, the fundamental thing, if you're going to... The, one, there are, there's probably about six to eight characteristics that really successful urban species of any sort of wildlife have. And number one is 
losing their fear of human. They, you've got to do that. If you want to live in the city, scavenge in the bush, scavenge from the, you know, in the parks, steal people's sandwiches, you have to overcome what is probably a very important and very ins- sensible fear of humans because they're not going to do you any good most of the time. But if you can overcome that fear, you've got a, a huge number of opportunities to, to do well in city environments, and that's, that's fundamental. And that's one of the things that the white ibis have done and the strawnecks have never done. You, you, could, you could never approach a strawneck ibis within a couple of metres as you can a white ibis in the middle of the town. Yeah. Now, um, uh, another anecdote, uh, when I was a, a young person, a child, uh, I had the good for- fortune of uh, meeting and knowing a well-known naturalist who was uh, doing a project where he was visiting white ibis Oh. Uh, nests at a rookery yep. and spraying them under their arms so that they could be oh. um, recognised from the, prior to wing tags and right. and whatnot. And on many occasions, I accompanied him on a paddle board where we'd paddle oh. out to we'd paddle out to an old Malaluka, you know, paper bark or something yep. on the fringes of this. Uh, we called it a lake, but it was essentially a big dam. Yep, and we would go to the nest and ring ring the legs of the chicks and spray adults and juveniles under their right. wings. Okay. Um, in that whole rookery, there were cormorants. There right. were a couple of species of cormorants. There were cattle egrets. There were white egrets, uh, great egrets, um, intermediate egrets, little egrets in the Australian. Uh, sense and there were white ibis, there were no straw necked ibis. Ah, okay. Uh, there were Nankeen night herons that, mm, that were living in nests in there. Uh, there were there were spoonbills, both yeah. both uh, Australian yeah. varieties, the yeah. spoonbill and the yellow bill, uh, royal, sorry, and the uh, and the yellow bill. Um, but yeah, no, okay. I can't remember any straw necks, and I visited and did this for maybe four years. Right. Um, Mm. Uh, so yeah, I can't. Um, so I think that sort of again anecdotal, but yeah. reinforces yeah. your point that yeah. the straw neck are less likely to um, uh, to hang around with people. But then again, in the park across the road from me, it is visited when the uh, crickets, the cricket yeah. larvae, uh, are out there. Um, by both white and right. straw necked ibis, never right. at the same time, though. Never they at the same time. Okay. No, never at the same time. Uh, so well, not, not that I've seen. So they, those two species are kind of dividing up because they have very similar tastes, you know. And so, yeah, that's interesting. I, I wonder whether we've got, because we've got pretty good, that must be good because the Macquarie Marshes people have been studying this for a long time. And, you know, the, the populations are, though they're, it, you would probably think if you just went from, inner city to inner city around Australia, you'd think white ibis are doing really well. They're actually, their overall population nationally is plummeting. Which, you know? which is what I was referencing earlier about, I think we're pushing them out yeah, exactly. from 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 the regions. Um, certainly, again, it's anecdotal because I don't do enough trips along the same route often enough to, to reference other than from back in my memory. Yeah. But straw neck divers seem more common to me in the places that I go to that are not urbanised right. than, than they were when I was a kid. They were a bit of a novelty to see really? for okay. someone who grew up in Melbourne, or right. actually I grew up in outside of Melbourne. Right. But, but you always saw white divers. Okay. Straw neck divers were a bit of a, a, right. a rarity um, south, of the, south of the divide. So. Without without data in front of me, I would say there were probably about equal numbers of the, both those two species, and they were very. It fluctuated massively. You wouldn't see any ibis at all when I lived in Wagga in the Riverina, but you know after a good season or a or a which happened frequently in when I was a kid, a uh, grasshopper plague, they'd turn up like crazy, they and they were always in. known as the um, yeah. you know the Palmer Springs in those places. So both yeah. species would be involved. It was always my completely uninformed view my opinion that the white ibis seemed in my experience as a youngster that they were the residents and that the straw necked were the ones that were moving about 
they were the opportunists. So, I, yeah, I, that, I'm not sure whether that's right because I've just seen data only in the last couple of weeks, which shows the extraordinary distances that both species are now mm. are, are traveling. And I guess we've had this really weird, wet couple of years, which has disrupted everything. So previous to this, we were worried about drought across most of Australia. Now we're opposite, we've got the opposite problem where there's flooding and everything. But the water birds think, are probably doing so, very happily. Thanks for that, because I did want the opportunity to let the rest of the world know that in, uh, in Sydney at the moment, they're having their fourth once in 500 year event in the last, uh, what is it? Uh, Two years, four ago. months. I four think. Months. It, well, I think it's four months. Uh, it's something you ridiculous. Climate's changing. Isn't it? Yeah, amazing that. Um, uh, when will they do something about it, Daryl? Oh. I wonder. It's crazy. Oh, wow. It's crazy. Right? Can we extrapolate your thoughts about the crows? And then yep. we were just been talking about bin chickens. Can we extrapolate that across? say starlings common miners uh sparrows it has to depend on whether they have changed a significant part of their behavior in order to prosper in the city so some birds so there's a big thing with urban urban ecology can can a bird or a, any sort of animal at all bring its own natural habit uh, ha habits or behaviors and bring them or does it need to change them in order to prosper in the city? So for example, brush turkeys is another species that I've studied a lot. They don't need to change anything. They just build bloody great mounds of anything. And they, well, whatever they do, they just, you know, they, they're non-discriminatory. Discriminatory. So they don't have to adapt. Whereas the ibis have, have are absolutely fundamentally changed the way they feed in order to access different types of food. So there's a difference there. So I don't, for example, so to do you those two examples, I can absolutely see that the ibis are going to change. I, they they could very well be the you know you know the the urbanised ibis versus the non-urbanised ibis. But with the brush turkeys, they won't because they haven't had to change anything. So if you can ch if you change if you adapt, you see an opportunity as an urban bird. You change your behaviour, and that re that results in more offspring. Then those birds are likely to evolve into a different subspecies way down the track. And that article which, which you referenced to, which started this whole conversation off, was me saying, now that there are ibis, uh, no, sorry, now that there are Teresian crows or other types of crows nesting in cities and nesting on buildings, the little bit of data I've got is that suggests that they are much more likely to survive a larger proportion of their young because the nests are on, on safely not in a in a in a in a tree, but in a in a, a sheltered part of, the, of a building, they're more likely to prosper and therefore spread their spread their genes into the next generation. So it's not at all difficult to understand or, or speculate that urbanised, you know, that the building uh, build, uh, building nesting crows are going to leave more offspring behind. Those offspring will think that it's completely normal to build on a on a, on a building, and that's they will continue to do that. And, and so that they could flood the gene pool eventually with, with the um, with being the, the, the types of birds that nest on the buildings because they they do well as a result. Uh, Australian example again. Yep. Per peregrine falcons nesting yep. in Melbourne uh, is uh, and every other city in the world just about. Yep. They don't. So, they, they, they haven't. There's a good example, Grant. They don't have to do anything. They're still nesting on cliffs, feeding on pigeon, and they don't have to do anything different. And now there's so many pigeons and so many cliffs available in all the big cities of the world that the peregrines are doing bloody well. You know, they nearly went extinct with DDT back in the 60s. Yeah. Now they're, they're back in big in, in business, and uh, and they haven't had to change at all. So they they are one of the ones that un, are unlikely to become urban. So, what did? Are there any other Australian examples? Because I'm, I'm thinking about the birds that have become more common yep. in, again, my experience is mostly in Melbourne. Yeah. Um, I'm mid fifties now. On the geological time time frame, that's not even a, a fart bubble in a bath. But um, 
in our in the history of of the Australian colony, um, it's starting to become significant. I ca- uh, rainbow lorikeets are the are the obvious one where they've become far more numerous. Silver gull would be yeah. another one, but rainbow lorikeets I don't think have changed no, their behaviour. They don't need to change. They're just still sticking that funny-looking toilet brush beak down into the into the plants that we've provided for them. So they but sil- just, they don't but need silver gulls. Yeah, silver gulls could be because they yeah. would have they'd, they'd be you know they'd be along the same lines exactly as the, what I've described about the foraging in ibis. They would have to do the same thing. They have to overcome the fear of humans. They've never never eaten chips before, but now they get them all the time. In fact, people feed them chips. What, please what don't do that. that. Please, 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 please don't feed chips to bloody gulls. Well, mate, tell, tell the grandma and the kids not to feed bread to the ducks. I mean, it's, it's a yeah. lot. Well, it's, a lot, it's, lot a, it's the same kind of thing. Can, can what is it, Pandaroo or whoever, those people who make yeah. native formulas for the animal hospitals and, and whatnot, can you Pandaroo. make a chip substitute? Yeah, a, a chip substitute? And well, uh, you, why not? I mean, yeah, and, and and sell them just in through Seven Elevens and milk bars and Coles and Woolies. You would be doing a massive favour yeah. to so the that's, wildlife that's of the country. A good point, Grant. I know I didn't force you into this, but this is another great point. So uh, we've talked about the benefits of what that an animal can get from living in in the city with us, but there's some terrible risks. And one of the risks for all those things that we've just described, especially foraging is that those animals might have terrible nutrition as a result. Mm. You can't live on chips. Just ask anybody who's tried to live on chips. You can't live <laughs> on is, chips. Which, which is why I am surprised that nobody has seen the opportunity. As you were just saying, and what were the statistics again for people who were feeding wildlife? Well, it's between 25 and 38% of, the, of, of households in Australia. Okay. So... Why would you not, as a food producer, be a snack food producer or anyone, not be marketing to between 30 and 40% of the population with a, with a specific product that we have the technology to easily make, I would imagine? Well, here's a little secret just between you and I and no one, no one else is listening, Grant. No one else. Okay. There's a manufacturer out there about to put out on the market, Magpie Meals. I think it's what that's what's called. They're going to be artificial worms. I'm, exactly. I'm all. I'm always late to the party, mate. <laughs> I thought no, I, I was about they, to sell a great idea. Because because one of the things, there's one thing I will tell people, and a lot of people who are listening to this, the 13 of them who are listening, at least three of them will be feeding mints to the magpies. That's something we. That the one big thing I've been trying to get across in the feeding arena is if you must feed don't feed anything mints mints is a terrible thing no and and uh shout out to claire greenwell dr claire who gave me the tip that if you feel like you have to feed your magpies or or anything and that you were thinking about feeding some kind of meat that is human consumption don't feed right. blood worms okay. get yourself a, a farm uh, yep, good idea. Teach the kids about gr- about reproduction and whatnot. Don't do mealworms. Do bloodworms. Uh, their shells and what and and their internal uh, configurations, their their guts, far better represent a healthy diet for a uh, a insectivorous and om- omnivorous bird. So. And at the, think at about the risk, think about that. At the risk of self promotion, and I wouldn't dare do it, but that book that you've shown up a couple of times, feeding the birds at your table, is full of practical suggestions about what you should feed. This one, a guide for Australia. It's sensible. It's it's um, you know as far as I could, proven what you can feed that isn't harmful to the birds. And we wouldn't want to do any self promotion, Daryl, and talk no, about and another we, one, and, and another one of your books. <laughs> so this is um, coming out the same year, just, just a couple of months apart, these two. So that's my so, next one. That's, that's the so, robotology one. 
I'm glad you're not yeah. promoting any of these things. Yeah, no, um, uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't dream of it. Um, so, uh, um, look, I'm, I don't, I, I'm, I'm not above shameless self-promotion or the promotion of others, as long as I think that what they are promoting is beneficial right. to um, uh, someone. Someone had a go at me on Twitter the other day saying. You're not a journalist. I said, no, I'm a bloody proponent and an activist. Right. I've never pretended to be a journalist. <laughs> and I reckon a lot of journalists are really stupid. I reckon a lot of journalists are really good. But yeah, activist journalists should be upfront and say they are activists. I'm a bloody activist. I'm an activist for the birds and yeah. for doing something about biodiversity and climate. If you don't good like on, it, piss off. On your There's plenty of other YouTube right. channels to watch Absolutely. and plenty of other podcasts to listen to. I'm an effing activist. End of story. Good on you. Good on you. All right. Back to you. Well, I'm going <laughs> to have to tell you, I've got terrible news. This co oh. this, my, my computer's about to die. Oh, I no, could. he didn't plug it in. He I didn't, didn't plug, plug it in. It in. <laughs> I didn't plug it in. And it's been, we've been more than an hour, mate. No one's going to listen to all of this. Uh, mate... Uh, my stats show that when people start watching or listening, they listen to, on average, ninety-five to a hundred percent. So well, there I, we go. I would have to say that I'm, and you know, I'm, I'm completely unbiased. But who wouldn't be intrigued by this conversation that we're having? I mean, it's fundamentally important and interesting all the way. Well, through. Well, if you're a bird nerd and if you're into wildlife, and I, look, you can generally put the the themes. The attitudes that we're talking about, you can mirror it over other wildlife as well. So yeah, if, course, if possums course. are your jam, you know, find yeah. the healthy things to feed possums. Yep. Um, plant good things for possums. Protect possums, koalas, emus, whatever it be. Absolutely. Uh, Frogs, whatever. Well, Daryl, I think we're going to make sure we speak to you again. I reckon uh, you we did barely cover the scratch the surface on this, so mate, I'll be very happy to come back and talk about all and, sorts of stuff. And as regular watchers slash listeners know, my regular Monday with Holly, we try to focus on urban birds and talk to people who are working with uh, wild birds in the urban environment, and uh, that's certainly your bag. And as I didn't know, you're. You know Holly well, so I think we can uh, we can, we can we make can, that happen. Now, All if right. you've got a few more minutes on your computer, I just want to let the people know yep. that be quick before the computer dies. Um, if you've got a question <laughs> or a comment that you would, a question particularly, if you want to put to Daryl while we've while we've got him here, um, please don't make it. Where can I get your books? Um, yeah, Google books. Daryl. Google Daryl Jones author and find out all the books that you might be interested in and then go to your local bookshop. That's where That's to get it. his books. Couldn't, couldn't say it better. The, um, both of the new ones, the, the Clouded Leopard one and the um, Curlew's one, are both not actually in, on the shelves yet, that one. But, but what you could do is say, oh, Daryl Jones has got a couple of new books coming out. Are they both coming out through Cornell? Uh, no, no, this one's the... Okay, the curly, so this curly. one is coming out through Cornell, so you can yep. go... When they go, we don't know that one, you can say, oh, Cornell University Press, Cornell Press, you can find it there. And for the curlews on Vulture Street... New, New South. New South Press. Or New South Books, I think it is, isn't it, actually? Uh, New South Publishing, maybe. Same, New same South thing. Publishing. So that's what you can tell the helpful shop uh, staff at your local bookstore, who you must already know well because you always exactly. buy your books from your local bookstore. Uh, and you can you can do that. Uh, what, else, what other things should we be thinking about if we consider feeding birds uh, in, in our all, home or in our park, Darren? First of all, do you really need to? Is there any reason to? But, but lots of people have the simple thing that they really want to be close up. To they want to. Yes. The connection with nature is the big thing. I've become convinced about how important that is. So that's, I've overcome my aversion for people feeding because I now realise that that's 
can be, especially during lockdown, that was a fundamentally important thing for lots of people, just being close to the animals. And you, and you can get close close to animals by attracting them into some food. That's the first thing. So that's that's a good thing to like to be close to birds. Never too much. Never put out more than just a tiny amount. For them, it's a snack. You are never providing all the food that they need. That's no, no, nowhere in the world are you providing all the, nu- the nutrition that those birds require. You couldn't. There's no way we could ever no. replicate no. what they get from their natural diet. So it's just a bit of a snack for them, and it's a wonderful encounter for us, and that's what we need to remember. Yeah. Now, you can go and um, find this article at... Culturico. Um, I'll put links, obviously, Daryl, for that. That's right. That's right. Uh, for you. that, uh, well worth a read. Thought provoking, and if you would like to check out the thoughts that Holly and I and Johanna Martins uh, had with with Professor David Phelan from the University of Sydney Veterinary School about feeding birds. Um, You can just search to feed or not to feed the bird emergency, or you can go to the bird emergency slash live and you can check out that discussion. Uh, Daryl, it's been great to internet meet you all the way from Kuala Lumpur, or not quite Kuala Lumpur, but close by in Malaysia. Yep. Um, I'm looking forward to doing it again absolutely well i will be in town i've that got me on a i'll be promoting these this this new book you know in a in a fairly vigorous way so i'll be in town at some stage in Melbourne. well let let us know with plenty of um uh plenty of leeway and perhaps we might if the um if the lurgy has disappeared Uh enough and it's all safe enough for all of us we might be able to all get in the one place wouldn't that be amazing That'd be fantastic. Uh, okay. That would All be right. great to sit around a, 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 a table and and talk about that eating while we're eating. Yep, right. <laughs> Magnificent. Thanks, Bird Nerds. I'm Grant Williams. This has been The Bird Emergency. That's Daryl Jones. Get the books. We told you where. Links will be in the appropriate places. Uh, Daryl, what's your Twitter? Uh, at Magpie, capital D, uh, M, I mean. Magpie Jones. D. Easy. Yeah, easy. easy. Uh, all the links will be uh, in the description. Been, been Monday with Grant, Bird Emergency. See ya. Thanks for being with us. Mate. Oh. Oh. Daggy you. wave time, Daryl. Daggy wave. There we are. See ya. <laughs> oh, hello, bird it's, nerds. Straight back to repeat. We don't need that. Um, so back here and that's okay. Oh, look at that. I'm not looking so flash, uh, without the top light on. I'll need to do something about that. Uh, I am, um, going to get something to, um, eat a little snack and I will be back shortly and then it's uh, the next part of this mega uh live stream of replays so yeah i won't be long
should have put the music on for you. I forgot. I'm not used to um, st streaming for so long. I usually I usually do one interview and and end it. But uh, yeah, this is all right. Okay. Um, uh, 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 um, all right. We're back to. Um, uh, give me. Eric Einstein, uh, Eisenstein, um, this is a different kind of uh, interview that I hadn't, hadn't usually done until until this, so let's, um, let's just go. I'm going to eat my carrot and, um, and let's go. 60 second countdown. Okay. And when it's down, we're up. Okay, great. Oh, out. Oh, our mics are live too. So. There we go. It's the bird emergency. I'm Grant Williams. I am a bird nerd, and it's a great delight to be joined by another bird nerd. <laughs> Can you believe that? Um, and a fellow podcaster, Eric Ein Eisenstein. I was always going to muck that up. Um, <laughs> I, I, I've been I've been telling myself, don't say Einstein. Don't say Einstein. Yeah, as you get to know me, you'll stop <laughs> saying Einstein. I promise. And uh, Eric's uh, Eric's got a podcast um, called The Avian Rebbe, and also it's a it's a multimedia uh, enterprise you got there. A, a store, um, a book. Actually, let me uh, let me get that up. Let's just get that out of the way. Where? All right. Oh no. Oh no, it's not there. It's not there. Well, we're um. What have I done? What have I done? Well, I'll get that up. The okay. house slapdash is this. Uh, if you if you're joining us live or nearly live, it's the middle of the night here, or it's early in the morning, so that we're fitting in with the the time frames across the world. Oh, and I should note too, JJ Harrison took the photo behind me of the critically endangered swift parrot. Mm. Um, thank you, Wikimedia um, Commons, for allowing me to um, to have access to that. Beautiful shot. Uh, Nectar-feeding parrot and a migratory parrot. Uh, you might... Do you know about the swift parrot? Eric? I don't. That's, uh, that's the first one I think I've ever seen. Uh, they breed in Tasmania and then they migrate across... Bass Strait onto the mainland, and they follow the flowering eucalypt uh, oh. season, and they're a nectar feeder, but they are not a true lorikeet, and they're called the swift parrot because they're really, 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 really fast yeah. when they're flying. So uh, beautiful, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so tell us, tell us how you got into into birds, because right. you you have a very different uh, slant on the love of birds than I do. And yeah, just for it. And I'll, I'll bring up the, um, your book in just a second. So. Okay. So this all started with, uh, for me, right around the onset of COVID. Um, I was pretty much aware that uh, COVID was going to force us to be alone and outside. And I decided that I wanted to buy a camera. I had never owned a camera before, never a grown up camera. And one of my friends uh, decided to get me a camera uh, hooked up. Uh, and so I went to the camera store with him and right before everything shut down, all the stores, uh, I bought a camera. And I started going to the parks every single morning, uh, walking, patrolling, haunting, uh, trying to find a place psychologically as well as physically that was safe, uh, that was stable, uh, and that was unaffected by COVID. And so I took my camera, I started walking through the parks, and I started teaching myself how to take photos of birds. And... I took some really awful photos, uh, but they were the very first that I'd ever taken. And I put them up on Facebook with a little bit of dark humor. And 
really used it as a way to uh, provide therapy to myself and as it turned out to a few other folks as well. And it started to resonate a little bit. People kind of liked it. And then I got a call from my rabbi who said, uh, Eric, would you do something for me? And I said, yes, what would you like me to do? And he said, I'd like you to start teaching uh, each Friday night in our, at that time, Zoom service uh, about what you're doing on Facebook. And I said, really? Uh, that's really quite an honor and I would happily do so. And so in the last now going on uh, about 97 weeks, uh, every week, I take two photos and, and you can see them on the screen here. And I write two short teachings. They're called Drashot, uh, which is a short teaching uh, inspired by the divine that I see in nature, uh, the beauty of the birds, uh, a little bit of Jewish wisdom or spirituality, and then relate that to where we are in the world today um, and how the beauty of birds uh, can provide us strength and uplift, joy and inspiration. Uh, what started as a pushback against COVID has now evolved into an ongoing uh, study of, of the world's beauty uh, and what birds can contribute and inspire. So that's what I do. Tell me, I'm, I'm interested uh, in the camera setup that you, um, uh, that you settled on uh, because it wasn't, it, it sort of wasn't your choice, was it? Somebody was advising you and said, here, here's a good camera. Uh, yeah, go for it. So uh, yeah, what do you I, end up with? So I use a, a Panasonic Lumix G9, which is a micro four thirds uh, machine uh, with the Panasonic Lumix uh, Leica uh, 100 to 400 lens. It's I, I guess it's probably the best uh, telephoto lens that's available for that camera. And uh, you know it's it's a little bit different. I mean you know the there are other cameras that have larger sensors or faster lenses, certainly bigger lenses. Um, but you know, what I've got, uh, works very nicely for me. The, the photos, I don't get all the same photos that some people will get, but the photos that I do get, I'm quite pleased with. Uh, and it's a light system, uh, which if you're walking around out in the park for four or five hours is nice. Uh, it's not terribly expensive as compared to some others. And uh, it's small enough that I can put it in a little backpack and take it on the plane. So that's pretty great. So it's a, uh, it's a workable system for me. And all of the photos uh, that you see here on my website at, at avianrebi.com, uh, all of the photos were taken with this system. So it, it, uh, it works. It, yeah, it's, um, uh, I don't know if you're aware that I do an occasional sort of spin-off uh, series called Photography Friday with a photography mm. with an F uh, or a talk with people who are much better uh, photographers than me. And I'm, I'm going through my purchase journey at the moment huh? and um, I'm pretty settled on, on joining the, uh, the, the Panasonic uh, Lumix tribe. Uh -huh. but I'm I'm probably going to go for a um, one of the secondhand uh, video and right. stills cameras just because I I want to be doing video production as uh -huh. much as as taking stills. But yeah, I'm sold on the micro four thirds just be, from the weight and right. the size point of view for for traveling for for getting around. Yeah, there's uh, one of your one of your countrymen, uh, Andrew Goodall, uh, has uh, a beautiful site called Nature's Image. Yeah, Photography. Nature's Image. I'm, I'm and, hoping to, I'm hoping to speak with Andrew. Andrew's uh, good people. Yeah, yeah. he's a, he's on my list to to get in onto um uh, onto Photography Friday. But of course, Andrew runs a, a tour and workshop business yeah uh, uh, alongside his portrait photography and right. whatnot that he does right. uh and uh, and i think he's gonna gonna be away for for mm. quite some time because okay. of course everyone who does tours hasn't been able to go anywhere exactly for so long. 
Exactly. Yeah. Now, yeah, Eric, was... Eric let, let, let me just say, uh, I'm, I just saw, I, I, I was giving side eye, I just saw a, a, someone liked uh, a post on Twitter and it was someone who shouldn't be up at this time. So <laughs> I'm wondering, I'm wondering if Linda is is watching if you are linda just say something or give us a thumbs up in the in the comments and i would just have to say what the hell are you doing up <laughs> at the at, at the moment but it just seemed weird that uh someone came in uh, just after uh linda liked the um or yeah linda liked the uh, uh the notice that we were going to be nice. live on on Twitter, that I'm would fr- that would freak me out. If uh, and yeah. and if it isn't, uh, welcome, hello, <laughs> hello, Facebook, hello, YouTube. Uh, nice of you to be with us. If if you do have a um uh, a question or a thought, um, and you're watching, um, pop it in the uh, in the comments, uh, and I will uh, will will react to it. You know, uh, we'll we'll do that. One of the things I was really interested to to speak to you about, Eric, um, because it's quite different to my personal um, experience with with life, is the 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 spiritual fulfillment or it, it, maybe reinforcement is perhaps the right word that you experience being in nature and watching birds and how that um uh, how that is is an essential part of your life now Mm -hmm. um and and i only say now because i'm i'm gathering that your your really quite intimate relationship with birds is a new one that's right can you fill us in on 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 how how your spirituality uh and actually let let, let let's explain what 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 a rebbe is okay. uh it, a, as part of this uh part of the discussion but sure yeah how how have how has your relationship with with birds um impacted on your spirituality mm-hmm. and and vice versa let's... yeah i mean the fundamental premise of, of my spiritual outlook is that, uh, and you can call it religion, uh, you can call it spirituality, uh, within the confines of religion, uh, I'm Jewish, but it could be Christianity, it could be Islam, it could be, you know, whatever perspective. Uh, High space and little Legos, um, I'm here. That, that that spiritual encounter or religious <clears throat> encounter, or shall we just say the encounter with the divine is not limited only to uh, a church or a synagogue and it's not limited to only a sunday or a saturday that there is the presence of the divine in every aspect and presence uh, in in every place that we go uh, and in all the times that we experience and so that to me is really kind of the fundamental premise that um, as we go out in a park as we go to a seashore, as we go to the top of a mountain, uh, we can encounter the divine. And as I go to these different places, uh, they're very, very different. uh, And they have very different impacts on the way that I think. So for example, I've I've just finished my second book, uh, which is going to be available the end of October. And it uh, the subtitle of it is left Texas, uh, the the western half of the state of Texas. Uh, that's the first book. And, you know, this one is about central Texas. And Hello, Space and Little Legos. Um, I'm here. This is a replay of, of an episode that we did a while ago. This has been like I've played three episodes of the... Uh, uh, of, of the show um i'm here if you've got any comments or observations that'd be great um but yeah i'm not really just bouncing back and forward but if you've got something that's relevant i'll i'll pop the comment up 
such as um, you know, such as that. <laughs> but yeah, but I'm here. Um, but these uh, uh, these are replays. But if you've got anything you want to ask or, or contribute, um, certainly pop it in there. Um, I'm kind of enjoying because. Uh, well, first, tell me tell me where you, where you are. What part of the world are you in? Um, because if you're in the northern hemisphere, it's really cold and it's winter. Whereas where I am, it's the middle of summer, and we. Basically, the country shuts down for for January. Everyone is taking their holidays. Um, so, because I can't get people to interview this week because they're all off doing field work or they're all enjoying holidays at the beach or a lot of people are actually catching up on birding trips that they haven't been able to do during the whole pandemic. So, I'm just going back. I've got, you know, a hundred odd episodes to... Uh, so we're just going back over some of them that I wanted to play again. Now, um, Eric is very different to what we normally do. If you're new to the, to the show, uh, usually I'll speak with bird researchers or policy makers and things like that. But Eric is, as he's about to explain, um, business person from Texas um, and he discovered photography and birds and a reawakening of his spirituality by being connected to birds so we'll kick we'll kick back into it now um, but yeah let, uh, actually let me know where which part of the world are you are you in um, it's always nice to get to know yeah and the birds and the environment and the kind of perspective that comes from being uh, in the hills and the dryness of central Texas. And certain birds uh, and certain environments lead to certain thoughts. And so, you know, when you go out to the desert, uh, you have a different experience than when you're on top of a mountain, than when you are next to a running river when you are uh, down in the scrub brush uh, of South Texas. And so all of those different places inspire different thoughts. And one of the things that, at least for me, is so beautiful about birding is by definition, you're gonna be quiet and you're going to be, in the way that I do it, moving, uh, hiking, trekking, you're going to be alone. And just having that environment provides a, a context uh, for thinking in different ways. You know, for four or five hours on a Saturday or Sunday morning, uh, nothing is beeping at me. Uh, nobody is calling. Uh, nothing is ringing. And I'm able to just spend the time alone with my thoughts, uh, looking at the world in a slightly different way. And when I see a bird like this little gray cat bird, you know, it's, it's fascinating. I mean, if you, if you look at parts of it, they're very dark. Uh, if you look at the eye, uh, you know, it's jet black, except for the light that's reflected back. And the exposure is such that the, the little red uh, uh, feathers there at the, at the vent are able to pop out. You know, those are the kinds of things that make me look at the world in a different way. And that, that to me is what spirituality is. It's, it's primarily uh, about appreciation. It is about awareness. It is about conscious, intentional looking uh, and having the time to think. And birding has given me all of that. And it's, uh, as you say, it, it is relatively new uh, just in the last couple of years, but it has been extremely influential uh, in shaping my life. Um, so let me use that as a way to tell you what a Rebbe is. Uh, when I started doing this, uh, as I said, my rabbi was the one who invited me to, to teach. Um, and, and we kind of jokingly, sort of tongue-in-cheek, uh, said, okay, well, I'm going to be the avian Rebbe. Uh, because a Rebbe in Jewish tradition uh, oftentimes is an ordained rabbi, but doesn't have to be. Uh, rabbi is a, uh, an official, if you will, cleric, 
who has ordination, which I do not. Um, but a Rebbe, more than just being, um, uh, shall we say, a rabbi in that context, is a community leader, uh, a teacher, and a storyteller, uh, amongst other things. And as I say, it started out kind of tongue in cheek. I was, you know, there, there, there are no other avian rebbies. Um, and I took the title kind of self-deprecatingly, but it's really developed into something where now, you know, thousands of people each week, uh, see the work that I do. And some of the notes that I get and the, the words that people share tell me that it's really making a difference in their lives. And if I can do that, uh, then yeah, I've earned the title of Rebbe. And it is uh, growing and evolving, uh, becoming deeper for me. And I see the, the photos and the text together uh, as offerings uh, for God and community. And that's, that's what I hope to share with people. Uh, I'm really interested in uh, how you how you saw birds and nature before you started looking at them through the magnified lens of your camera um mm. it, it was was walking in in a forest or in uh in the bush as uh, as as we say here right. um i i a completely different experience for you before you had the had the camera like were birds just little brown or colorful things in the background before yeah, completely um I, I you know i i knew the the handful of common backyard birds of course you know in in my local area but i knew nothing of birds uh i had never studied them uh i was unaware of of so many of them. Uh, I had no idea that where I live in Central Texas is, uh, you know, it's on the, the north-south uh, migratory the flyway. flyway. Yeah. Uh, I didn't realize that we sat on the, the kind of the dividing line between uh, Western North America and Eastern North America. Had no idea of any of this. And, you know, it was funny when I first started getting into it. Uh, in fact, I wrote a piece about it. Um, there's a bird here called a crested caracara. It's a it's a big bird. It's it's the size, oh, I'd say almost the size of a vulture. I mean, it's it's a yeah. It, it well, it 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 is a vulture, isn't it? I think it's I, I think it's actually a falcon. Um, oh, okay, right. But on. it's but it's comparable. But um, it, and it's a and big dumpy looking falcon though. It's it's yeah, big. So, it's yeah, big. It, yeah. It has that sort of slump when it's resting it it's not tidy like a yeah, right. it's it, 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 it's sort of it, it's like some of the some of the big uh well we we've got one here the whistling kite that it always looks like it's kind of just got up you know uh -huh. it's just got out <laughs> a, a bit like me at the moment it Very always nice. whereas nice. you know you, you look at a, a peregrine falcon and they right they are dapper right yeah yeah and, yeah, yeah. And, and and for instance our goshawks uh are, are snappy you know they're <laughs> snappy dresses yeah uh, yeah but i think the the, the caracara is very much a, uh all right do i have right. to come mum all right yeah, yeah all right i'll do my hair i know. was gonna say it needs needs a shower and a, and a <laughs> shave yeah. Yeah. yeah so it's a but you know it's a it's a big bird and and they're fairly uh, prominent and they're they're uh, relatively common around here now, uh, more so than they used to be. And and when I saw photos uh, that folks had posted saying, you know, I saw one here and so, I I was astounded. I said, my God, I've lived here my whole life and I've never seen this bird. How can it be? You know, it, it, it they're making it up. That can't really be a real bird. And sure enough, uh, it is. And you know, same thing with a painted bunting. Uh, a bird that I had never seen before. And, and now uh, I see, you know, every summer. Um, and you don't have to go to, to some, you know, incredibly exotic location. I mean, you, you may not see it in your own backyard, but you might. Uh, 
and you'll certainly see it at a, at a park with any open space. Um, they're common. But I was completely oblivious. Had no idea that, that all of this was going on around me. And, and I think, you know, your, your question is a very insightful one, which is, um, when do we start to see things? Uh, when we start to look for them. And, you know, there's, there's a lot there uh, that I think also has a spiritual analog, that uh, there are things around us all the time uh, that we simply fail to notice. What got me thinking about your sort of awakening, and that, that's sort of the really interesting uh, uh, thing about um, your relationship with, with birds, um, was that it sort of just sort of happened. And, right. And, and, and because my connection with birds started so young, I can't, mm. I can't imagine a time where I wasn't fascinated by birds. Oh. I just can't think back to a time where I just went, oh, gee, birds are cool. And then right. I, um, I've recounted many times. I was that kid lying on the on the floor of the lounge room um, after after dinner with a sketchbook, you know, drawing wow. drawing birds and imagining all the uh, all the birds I would one day see. And nice. And, you know, um, but I. I'm also interested in that spiritual connection, Eric, that it has it only been birds. Like if you're in a forest, if you were in a forest beforehand, like five or six or seven years ago, did you not, I mean, had you ever been to the Redwoods in California and, and, I have. and looked up, I mean, I haven't been to the Redwoods, but we've got the Mount Nash forest here. Uh, you know the tallest, um, tallest trees on uh, on earth. You go to a, a forest here and you look up, and you cannot not appreciate right. the majesty of right. of a, a a healthy forest ecosystem. Right. So how how was that? I mean, did you experience that feeling earlier? And how did how was that divorced from birds and other, you know? wildlife yeah i mean the answer to your question is yes i've been to uh some very very majestic places and seen some very very beautiful uh animals on, on land uh and 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 the ocean as well uh snorkeling and and seeing fish um and and you're right uh there is a beauty and a majesty there that is inspiring um but it hasn't resonated with me in the same way that birds do. And, and I don't know if that's a function of flight, uh, of color, of song, of variety, of proximity. Um, you know, there's, there's something about, I mean, if you look historically, um, you know, you think about ancient China and, and what is uh, the symbol of majesty and miracles and wonder in ancient China, it's the dragon, uh, a serpent with wings. Uh, if you go back to uh, the, the ark uh, that held uh, the Ten Commandments, uh, what is on the cover of the ark? Uh, two angels, uh, little children or cherubs uh, with wings. Uh, the Aztecs uh, have wings uh, in their sacred animals. Uh, the story of Icarus is the story of flight. You know, there's something about flight that I think resonates in a very deep place uh, across time and space uh, with all of us. And, and even when you ask people today, uh, what superpower would you like? You know, I can wave a magic wand, what superpower? 95% of people say, I wanna be able to fly. There is something about birds that is special and different uh, in a way that for me, flowers, butterflies, insects uh, don't have that same resonance. Um, and, is and, the, sorry, go, go well, on with that thought. Say, and, and, but you know, it, it is important to me. I mean, when I teach, one of the, the, again, coming back to this kind of universality, for me, it's birds. If you were to find uh, the divine in trees 
or in flowers or in insects or what have you, that's great by all means. You know, it, it, I don't think that there is anything necessarily exclusionary about birds in the sense that, you know, only birds uh, are able to provide this kind of, of insight or guidance. Um, that's the channel that I follow. And, and if there are other ways to get there, then, you know, I am, I'm all for it. Based on what you just said, I'm really interested if your spirituality, your, your personal religious experience has deepened or improved or increased um, based on the discovery of birds. Like, ha has, has definity or devoutness, for want of a, a, a better term, um, uh, become greater for you because of your new relationship with birds? Yeah, that's a beautiful question. And the answer is, is an overwhelming yes. Um, I, I had been a, let's say, less aware person um, for a very long time. And, uh, and my religious observance uh, was tied to holidays. It was tied to uh, particular meals. It was tied to uh, being at the synagogue uh, or life cycle events, uh, those kinds of things, the, the kinds of things that, that are important. They're, they're, they're important punctuation marks, but, they, but they're limited. Um, and and can, can I maybe make an assumption that does, does that mean that your religious observance was habitual and society driven in earlier in that you were doing what you do you know um... there's yeah there's there's certainly an element of that yes i mean no question no question um it it was by way of contrast now on a daily basis on a continuous basis through the course of the day the awareness of the divine infuses my day and if I see a bird at the feeder uh, on my deck, or if I see a bird uh, flying uh, across the sky while I'm filling up my car with gas, uh, or I'm out actively uh, looking to receive photos in the park, um, you know, all of that is a, is a constant reminder. There's a, there is a tradition in Jewish uh, life that says that you should say 100 blessings each day and you know you can you can easily make the argument that that okay uh, god wants us to give uh, to the deity a hundred blessings and it is for god's benefit i would suggest it's exactly the opposite that the that the the value of that uh regimen if you will is actually for the people saying the blessings that by saying a hundred blessings during the course of the day, it forces you to be aware of, you know, I woke up today. That's pretty good. I had a meal today. That's pretty good. I saw a sunrise. I saw a sunset. I saw a beautiful mountain. I saw a special bird. All of these gratitude practices uh, that we do during the course of the day make our day richer, more meaningful, more invigorating. Um, it has improved my relationships with people. Um, I am, as a result of, of doing much of the thinking and writing, I am more uh, in harmony with other people. I am gentler towards myself and others. Uh, this, this kind of awareness that has come from, I won't say bird watching, but watching birds, um, has, has really uh, deepened and improved my daily life in fundamental ways. Yes. Do you, do you think that this awakening, I hate using these grandiose terms. Well, it's not a bad term. But, but, but I think when, when you are equating it on a personal level, because, you know, everyone exists in their own head. Sure. Um, uh, but 
do you think this awakening would have happened if if we didn't have the the pandemic and the lockdown like do, do you think this love of birds and and I want to I want to extend that to the to the yeah. to the natural world a little bit further right. because right because e- e- even if we choose to focus on birds I don't think any of us can be well actually maybe we maybe some of us can now, some twitchers I think fail to to see anything other than the bird that they're checking off in front of them um uh, but do you think that this awakening was was ready to occur and that may have occurred anyway if the pandemic and the isolation um, wasn't a, 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 an accompanying condition? No, uh, I don't. I'd like to think it would have, uh, and I don't believe it would have. I, I think that the... I think that the the impetus to move in this direction uh, was COVID. And I hate to say anything good about a global pandemic that killed millions right. of people. Um, and for me, uh, that was that was what set it all off. Um, as I say, my my awakening, my slowing down and noticing what was around me because remember how slow things were. Mm-hmm. Um, is a direct result of what came out of COVID. And when I was writing and taking photos at the outset, particularly in the, in the very darkest days of the pandemic, when, when we were still locked down and before vaccines and when, you know, death rates were, were daily news, um, you know, this was a, a desperate, um, visceral reaction trying to find some kind of light to share with people. And, um, and, and that sense of intensity certainly would not have occurred otherwise. Uh, this, is, th- this was reactive. This was my pushback um, and, a, a, and a quest to find something that, that was still the way it ought to be. I mean, to go to the park in the morning and watch the sunrise and listen to the birds wake up and sing and then start to, to feed, you know, that was stability. Uh, the birds didn't know that there was a pandemic and the sun still rose. And I, I reckon the birds knew well and truly yeah. that, that we weren't getting in their way as much. Maybe so. As we used Maybe to. so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe so. But I mean, it was it was the kind of thing that that helped me to contextualize the horror where, you know, in in historical terms, epochal terms, you know, COVID is going to end up being a blip. You know, a thousand years from now, we probably won't talk about COVID. Um, We talk about the Black Death. We talk about, you know, some of the other uh, catastrophes of, of human history that we're aware of. Um, maybe COVID will register, maybe it won't. Uh, for those of us who lived through it, and more to the point, for those of us who lost people in it, we'll certainly uh, talk about it. But in the natural scale, you know, the sunshine, the bird song, it doesn't register. And to be able to hold on faithfully to those things that didn't change was incredibly important to me. That was, that was a rock. Uh, that was a place. And, and I needed that at the time. And as it turns out, so did quite a few other people. And uh, that's what I hope to be able to offer. Yeah. Um, uh, I share your unwillingness to be grateful for a global pandemic. And, of course. And, 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 and Let's also note that it is not over. Yeah. Um, I think I think there were nearly 500 people died in the US yesterday. I think that's wow. we're trending down, but it's still happening. Sure, um, we're losing. Um, uh, I, I still think about 100 a day here in Australia. 
uh, which means we're punching above our weight. You know, you guys are right what, 340 million and we're, right. we're nowhere near it. So, um, yeah. yeah, that's, uh, so it, it's not over, even though we've all moved past it, whatever that, whatever that means. But if, if you can take a silver lining out of any black cloud, is that more people have found birds and bird watching and and their local their local parks their local right. patch and become right. familiar with it and perhaps value it more than they did prior so if that sense of community and um, connectedness to the natural things that are still around in their neighborhood if that's become something that is common and and i don't know if it's only in privileged western societies or if it's worldwide um i hope it has been greater than that but that's one thing we can yeah. uh, we can be be thankful for even though we're still killing the we're still knocking down the habitat of, of this little fella where are we this little fella yeah the swift right. parrot as uh right um uh, i don't know if we're i don't know if we're awake awakened enough <laughs> on mass yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, no it's uh, it, it's a very good point i mean you know one of the things that was interesting is is of course you know there were massive internal migration patterns uh here in the us is where i'm obviously most familiar and you know people moved out of uh you know, kind of more urban areas to either suburban or exurban areas. Um, because if you're going to, you know, it, it's great to be in the penthouse of a, of a condo tower, but it, the penthouse is a thousand square feet. Uh, and, and you can live in a suburban house that's 4,000 square feet and has a backyard for the same price. Uh, what do you do when there's, you know, a respiratory plague? Uh, you need a little space. And, and people started moving to places and starting, you know, moving out of cities and into more rural areas uh, precisely because uh, I want to hike, I want to kayak, I want to raft or bike or what have you. And I, and I hope, and it's a hope at this point, that we will come to appreciate the value of that open space and the animals and plants and what have you that live in it. Um, in anticipation of what will be, you know, either COVID part two or, or whatever the next, the next uh, one is. Yeah. yeah. Can, because, can I clarify what you meant there? And if it was a personal situation, like w when you said move to somewhere else, do you mean people actually um, picked up sticks and moved like uh, transplanted their life or sold their or, home here, bought yeah. a home there? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Um, Huge numbers of them in the U.S. Huge. See, at, at our experience of COVID, certainly where, where I live, um, we, are, we here in Melbourne were either the most or the second most locked down uh, right. city in the world. Right, right, um, right, right. Depending on, on how you do it. But right from really early on, I wasn't allowed to on our, our two hours that we were allowed for exercise. I wasn't allowed to go more than five kilometers from yeah. home. And my yeah. my chosen supermarket was six kilometers away. Right? Of course it was. So, yeah. um, so we we had the that situation where we, you know, people people who had bought homes and were wanting to relocate prior to the lockdowns, they weren't allowed to. That, um, that you, if you had a holiday home yeah, uh, yeah. For, for this first period, period, you couldn't go there, right? Oh, it, it, oh wow. It, that, then it kind of got, you know, when <laughs> when some people in government found they couldn't go to their holiday right. homes, yeah, of well. course they changed yeah, the yeah, rules yeah. a little bit. Yeah. They made it a bit grey. Um, yeah. But I live across the road from a park, mm. and so I could – go over and spend my hour or two hours yeah. in the park. Yeah. Uh, and 
I sort of did that anyway, but I did notice that more and more people were coming to the park. So I started feeding the cockatoos and the corellas. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I watched my neighbours enjoy birds. Right. Because they, they had never seen them. And all of a sudden there's 50, 60 squawking white right, right, and, right. and pink and grey birds. And, uh, and, and we're lucky with the... Uh, the plantings are all native and uh, and mm. a lot of eucalypts. So we've got lots of honey eaters, wattle birds and, mm-hmm. and things here and a resident pair of magpies, uh, Australian magpies. It's quite uh-huh. distinct from, from your magpies. Our magpies are basically black and white crows okay. um, that don't behave like crows, um, <laughs> but they are corvids. Uh, so, I I did always see a silver lining about yeah the the situation that we were in, um, you know, as the daily death counts and press conferences were right. were being held and all that kind of stuff. It was really nice just to be able to see the cockatoos and corellas being cockatoos and corellas. Yeah, um, yeah. So uh, having you know a little bit of distraction therapy, uh, if nothing else. You know, being able to just focus on anything other than the horror was valuable. And and to then be able to extrapolate that and say, you know, uh, we're going to get past this at some point um, and, and at some cost. But, you know, it, it ultimately, uh, I was convinced, would be something that, that receded. And, um, and, and being able to maintain at least a little bit of optimism that there was a light coming. Uh, was very important, very important. I really appreciated the sense of normalcy that, you know, life goes on that exactly. I was getting from watching the birds. And especially right. it was so long, I was able to watch um, oh, stuff you know, that up. Two, two broods of new birds yeah. come along, you know, the new, yeah. uh, you know, the squawk, there's nothing like a squawking cockatoo chick. Um, <laughs> they sound horrible. Uh but yeah, begging, begging for food. Um, mm. it, it was really good. I, I guess you guys have a different experience. As you mentioned, you're on the North South, um, flyway in the States and, right. and you're also in that area where birds move seasonally also, uh, East to West a little bit and el- altitudinally as well. So you don't only have the long migrants, you have the seasonal migrants shuffling around. Um, We don't have that pronounced migration here uh, in Australia. We have, you know, seasonal visitors and Mm -hmm. and whatnot. Um, As a rule, I mean, there are some places that are different, but anybody who's on the flyway with you has the opportunity to see you know, hundreds and hundreds of species oh, yeah. each year if they're looking. Yeah. Um, and if they're feeding, uh, right. that that they can pop into their into their backyard. So you mentioned you've got the feeder out. What are what are some of the really notable things that you have experienced in your backyard? Well, um, so right now it's it's hummingbird season. Uh, which I just, uh, you know, like anybody, I marvel at them. Uh, so they're beautiful. Um, and right now we're just starting to get, uh, this is the the official start of peak migration season for the fall. So uh, I saw Baltimore Orioles the other day in my backyard. And it's, it's a beautiful bird um, that until a year ago, I had never seen before. Uh, they're around. Um, I saw an indigo bunting, uh, just a few weeks ago for the first time in my backyard. That was incredible. Um, I, I put in, uh, some native habitat and a water feature, uh, and I ended up with a collection of, uh, cedar wax wings that are just spectacular. And they, and they were gathered around the water and uh, they're exploding in motion and light color and the water is spraying everywhere, and the light hit it all just right. Um, and so I've gotten some really uh, beautiful photos uh, just in the backyard. Um, 
the 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 flip side, you know, again, it's the natural world. So all of these um, dove and uh, siskins and warblers that I'm seeing in the backyard also mean that I have hawks. So I get uh, Cooper's hawks uh, and broad-winged hawks uh, who like to to take up a uh, kind of an oversight position uh, above that water feature waiting for an unsuspecting bird to be too involved in its bath. And, uh, you know, I've seen some interesting, uh, shall we say, interactions uh, between the birds in my backyard. Um, oh. it's, it's, it's real. You know, it's, it's beautiful and it's awful. A-W-E, it is full of awe. Um, it is real. And, and that that's important to recognize that, you know, not everything is Hollywood. Um, you know, uh, a bird that I like to watch uh, is also the meal for another bird that I like to watch. And it is, it's a, it's a powerful statement uh, about the reality of the world in which we live. Uh, that, that, that is, that is nature. Let me put my horticulture hat on because I, uh, I'm a horticulturist by training. Okay, uh, Eric. So, how much, how much thought or planning did you put into uh, the term I picked up on was creating some native habitat? Um, how and and how difficult is it to get sort of really good specific local advice over there yeah. for uh, for cre for trying to rebuild uh, some right. a, a resting stop because right. that's right. what's important that's in, right. in your neck of the woods. Yeah. So it, it actually was surprisingly easy. Um, there, there were the, the primary uh, resource that we have uh, is the Audubon Society, which is the, you know, the, the largest bird focused conservation group uh, in North America. And Audubon publishes on their website, a recommended list. Uh, you can put in your, your postal code. Uh, so a very, you know, specific small geographic area. I mean, not, not even an entire city, but just a, a very small piece of a city. And, and it'll say, okay, here are the plants that are well adapted uh, to your soil conditions, to your climate, to your water conditions, and uh, will uh, work for the birds uh, in this area. And, and in fact, uh, if you plant this, you'll attract these, you know, uh, a trumpet vine attracts hummingbirds. Um, something that puts out seeds uh, will attract uh, something else. So between, I, I started with the Audubon list and then I hired a garden designer uh, who is, is aware of these things and focused on them. Um, and put together a, a plan. And my area is not very large. I mean, it's, it's only a few square yards. Um, but, you know, I got a nice mix of plants uh, and it's beautiful. And it is uh, a variety of, you know, it provides habitat, it provides shelter, it provides food. And then uh, I also put in the, the water feature. Um, and uh, you know, I, I get some really, really uh, special experiences uh, by being able to watch the birds out there. And it wasn't wasn't cheap, but it wasn't, you know, tens of thousands of dollars either. Um, and, and I feel really good about uh, the investment that I've made, uh, not just in the habitat, but in my own, you know, personal benefit. It's, I, I get a show in my backyard every day. That's pretty yeah. nice. Forgive me for looking off to the side, but of course I googled trumpet vine to see yeah 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 uh, which, which one uh, you were referring to. Have you got the red one or the orange one? Um, I think they recommended both actually for this area. Okay, because so, I've got no, I've I've got one which is a pyrostegia, which I'm I knew, and another one called camp uh, campsus, um, which is also called the trumpet creeper. Okay. Um, quite. Uh, let me let me put the flower up, and we'll see whether um, uh, whether it's it's the one. Uh, what a oh, there we go. There's the good. There's the 
photo. Let me let me pop this up and can tell me if okay. Is yeah, that, is that that's the one? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and right. you can see. I mean, you, you can almost Camps see. Is, Camps you know, is radicans. Yeah, oh, yeah, I mean, squint just a little bit, and you can see the hummingbird. You know, sticking yeah. its beak yeah. into that flower. Um, yeah. You know, they're perfectly made for each other. So yeah. it's uh, it's and, nice. Um, now before before you uh, rushing out to find it in Australia because it's so beautiful, um, can be. Uh, it's it, it's one of the big noniaceae uh, climbers, which is like the uh, Tacoma area. Uh, what not it can be invasive over here mm. so please don't go and don't go out and get it but you can get other big noni i see big no local yeah um well i don't think we've got uh, uh we may have we may have a tropical uh one from far north queensland but no certainly not any local ones in melbourne but the pandaria will do the job just fine here in Australia um, uh, sure. or in, in, in Eastern Australia anyway. Um, I, I'm, I'm wondering, um, Eric, with the, let's go back to the awakening and the awareness of the, mm -hmm. uh, of the birds around you. Um, what, what made you want to write and, uh, and share your experience uh what like have you got a like a is there a local synagogue that you started talking with or were you like me annoying all your friends and family all the time talking about the amazing bird yeah. that you just saw and they're going what <laughs> what yeah, are you it, talking about i, I a little of both <laughs> so i started annoying people on facebook uh, that, and, and, and when I say writing, I, I would maybe write literally two or three sentences. I mean, these were not well fleshed out, uh, you know, in-depth treatments of anything, but they are uh, well constructed. That's what I, I, I yeah, I they were point. very pithy. Uh, and so two or three brilliant sentences, uh, that, that, uh, you know, they got people thinking a little bit and maybe it was a little bit of a chuckle, uh, because, you know, we needed a chuckle. And, and then when I started uh, speaking, delivering basically a small sermon is the way to think about it. Uh, not preachy, but, but more just uh, really more of a lesson. In other words, um, I have seen uh, this bird and it made me think of this from our tradition. And I hope that in this way, uh, it would help us deal with what we're facing today. That's kind of the the model of of my my writing. And so let, now, let, can, sorry, I just yeah. want to I just want to extend that point because it comes back to to this sense of awakening and awareness uh, beforehand. When, when I'm I'm guessing that the points that you're trying to reinforce when you're speaking uh, to people and using birds as an example or as a uh, reinforcement um were, were those principles as evident to you prior to the pandemic and prior to your relationship with birds no uh, because the 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 essence of what i do is drawing a connection between two seemingly disparate things that's the key is so, so for example, the, the photo that you showed on the cover of my book is a northern mockingbird uh, that is about to or trying to uh, drive an American kestrel off a perch. That's a, that's a single photo. Uh, the, the birds, it, it, it's not a photo of two birds that were juxtaposed. It was a single photo. And, and so when I, I took that photo, um, and I explained in the, in the, let's call it the first paragraph of what I wrote, that what allows you to see this photo is that uh, you have to slow it down. In other words, when I was live in the park, I couldn't actually see that image. Instead, the photo, I think, was taken at one one thousandth of a second. And it's 
freezing the action in that split instant of time that allows you to see, wow, that looks really amazing the way that mockingbird is coming in with its wings spread and so on. Slowing down, stopping time. Shabbat, the Sabbath, uh, whether it's on Friday or Saturday or Sunday, is a period for stopping time. That's what we do. And it's baked into the structure of the universe as the universe was created. And that's what we're supposed to do. Stop. And when you stop, then you can see the appreciation, the savoring, the cherishing, the other wonderful things that are in the universe that during the six secular days we miss because we're going, going, going. We have this happening. We have that happening. There's tumult all around us. It's too much. It's overwhelming. It's only when you stop that you're able to see what really matters. And, and putting those two together, being able to see that the photographic process allows us to see the beauty of those two birds is, is analogous to what's happening with Shabbat. That's the, that's the lesson that I drew, the connection that I drew, that I wouldn't have done otherwise. It would have never occurred to me because I wasn't doing photography and I wasn't looking at birds. That's and, the learning. And, and, and so you've, you've led me beautifully to where I wanted to go ah, next and I, and I haven't good. had to find a way to jam it into the, into the conversation. That, that's why I started doing the photography Friday um, sessions because um, the sharing of bird photographs now that the technology and the uh, techniques are available to people uh, in a way like it they never have been before. Yeah. Even even with a uh, you know a a good mobile phone, right. you can right. do you can't do it with my old clunker, but with some of the new ones, you yeah. can still do some of the motion capture stuff that we that we're just talking about, and that allows us to appreciate what birds do but it also allows us to more easily share our right. our own experiences and the really amazing and unique things about birds and let's let's be clear also insects or whatever else sure. people choose to uh choose to do um I, i'm i'm what i'm i'm sort of curious how the how the appreciation of birds through photography, thanks to your friend who set you up with a yeah. uh, with a, uh, a a Lumix G nine. Uh, I'm wondering how that then led you to podcast the podcast. Yeah, so uh, you know, I started well, as I say, I started uh, very small, uh, one photo with two or three sentences on Facebook. And, uh, you know, and, and Facebook is wonderful and has its place, but I wanted to be able to uh, offer a, a more comprehensive presentation of the work that I do. So I started a website and, uh, and now all of my photos and all of my writing are posted on the website at, at avianrebby.com. Uh, um, then uh, I thought, well, you know, an email list would be a nice thing to develop. Uh, and so I started sending out uh, a newsletter once a week um, because that's another mechanism that people like uh, to be able to consume information. So that goes out. Then uh, somebody said, well, you know, what I'm really enjoying is when you speak, you give a little bit of the background and the context, you know, where did where was this photo taken? What were you thinking about at the time? Why did you go to this place as opposed to that place? What's the backstory? So the podcast is uh, the backstory. And it is, uh, it's usually just five or six minutes. Um, but I give a little bit of the backstory of a particular photo and, and teaching. And then I read it, I narrate it. Um, and so, you know, that's another mechanism uh, that people seem to like. And uh, the, the fun thing uh, now is I have this library of those. Uh, and in my second book, um, again, a, a COVID thing, we, we all learned about QR codes uh, in COVID. Um, yeah, these were some of the, the uh, potential uh, covers. Uh, so we, the top which left one won? Variant. 
a variant of the top left one is is going to be the uh, the second book, um, and and in the second book, every page will have a QR code uh, that links back to the podcast for that specific uh, bird and teaching. So uh, people will be able to get the backstory uh, and hear my dulcet tones uh, in addition to to simply reading the book. So it's it's fun to tie all these different media together. And really to, to meet people where they are. Some people uh, enjoy reading, others enjoy, uh, you know, an email. Um, there's something about a paper book, though, that, that people still really love. And, uh, and it's been a very gratifying experience putting that together. Uh, mostly when people say, uh, I'm buying 10 of these uh, because I want to give them as gifts to people. And knowing that, not that, that you bought my book, but that you liked it enough to give to 10 other people, that's really heartwarming. Yeah, that, that, that is, um, uh, it, it's, it's gratifying. I don't like to use the word so much, um, but I love it when people tell me that they not only like my show, but that they are sharing it and telling other Absolutely. people to listen. Um, it's, it, 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 it's nice to think that anyone actually gives a shit about anything that I say, you know, um, but yeah, that it, it is nice. Um, forward by Joe Smith. Tell me who Joe Smith is. Sorry. That's a placeholder. The, the four. Oh. Yeah. 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 That's a, those were placeholders. So the forward was actually written by Michael Barnes uh, and, and Michael, is is one of the deans of the Austin journalism scene uh, for 30 years. Um, he he writes about Austin. He also happens to be a birder. Uh, and Michael reached out to me, oh, back in February, I guess, and said, Eric, has you, has the, the, the local newspapers, the American Statesman, he says, has the local Austin, you know, the Austin American Statesman told the story of the avian Rebbe? And I said, not yet. And, and he said, beautiful, I'd love to write a profile. So, uh, you know, again, wow. Uh, so Michael wrote this lovely profile, which was uh, five or six pages in the newspaper, color photos. Uh, they did a video. It, it's really, it was quite, quite flattering. Uh, and so I, I am running that with his permission as the forward to this second book uh, to provide a little bit of context and background almost a transition between volume one and volume two. Um, so it, it's, uh, it's, it's really quite nice. So it, it's Michael Barnes. It's not Joe Smith. Uh, yeah. it, I would have been tempted to have something like a uh, forward by Homer Simpson or Max Power. Yeah. Right, or, right, right, right. Know. Yeah. Barack Obama. I would, I would have gone for yeah. Max Power. Yeah. I, I was, I was going to have Barack Obama write the forward, but uh, he couldn't get it done in time. So. Yeah. yeah, so so I got one of his kids. That's right. <laughs> yeah. That's right. That's um, right. Yeah. The, the the process of publication have did did you shop around and find a publisher or or have you self published? These are both self published. Um, I I did a decent bit of research and and found that for a publisher to do a book like mine, which is uh, 52 full color photos, uh, the economics just don't work. I mean, nice. I'd, I'd have to sell the book for $75 uh, for the publisher to make any money mm. uh, and for me to make a nickel. And, and I, you know, I have a day job. Uh, and, and so I self published these, uh, which has actually been a very interesting and fun process. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, I'm not going to get rich off of it, but, but I enjoy it and uh, it, it'll, it'll pay for a trip or two and that's nice. Um, but mostly it's about getting the work into the hands of people who will appreciate it. I mean, that's, it, it really is a, uh, a giving opportunity uh, rather than a, a straight up commercial enterprise. Um, so, yeah, so that's what I do. Um, the book the book will be available on Amazon uh, the end of October and will be available on my website uh, at the same time. I do signed copies, you know, on my website. 
um, and that's coming uh, very quickly. It's 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 all. I literally just submitted the files uh, for publication yesterday, so uh, it it's all hidden behind the scenes right now. The first book is is available for sale, but the second book will be coming uh, the end of next month after I check the proofs and and so on. So, but it's underway. So let's do some um, uh, some shilling. So there oh, we go. Thank the, you. the the avianrebi.com. You can get on the email list here. And there is a, a pretty healthy archive that you've got there. And and you've got a store. Let me let me get that up. So not only the book, but you're also doing prints. Um, and aluminium prints. Tell me about that. When, when oh, I saw that, I thought, what, what have you got, they're, what have they're you got here? Beautiful. Let's open that one up. Yeah. So oh. these aluminum prints... Um, uh, you know any of the any of the bird photos that that I've taken uh, can be printed on this aluminum, and uh, it, it's done by a company, obviously not not by me. But they're absolutely spectacular. I've got them, <laughs> I have them all over my own home. Uh, they're gorgeous. The 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 process that they use of printing these uh, colorful photos on aluminum just makes them absolutely pop. They're extremely vibrant. Uh, they're very, very easy to hang. They don't require a frame. Um, so it really is, as I say, I, I was decorating my home and I like my own cooking. And so uh, that little broad-tailed hummingbird uh, is hanging in my dining room and, uh, and they're gorgeous. Uh, I, I recommend the, the aluminum prints to people all the time. Uh, because they're just magnificent for yeah, any right. kind of photography. Anybody that's listening that's a photographer, if you've got a photo you really like, put it on uh, one of these aluminum prints. They're magnificent. Yeah, they um, they look good. And and I just while you were talking, walked through the uh, uh, the, the 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 purchase process. So what you do is you find one of the pictures that you like, and then you go and click on purchase, select the size, and then you have to put, you, you can't just select the, the, the yeah, picture. It, you have to describe the one you want. So, right, just, um, yeah. So yeah, but certainly it looks good. I'm, I'm guessing that you will, um, once you work out the shipping cost for wherever in the world, you're happy to send them wherever in the world? I, I think so. I. So these actually go from the manufacturer to direct to the person, to the buyer. And so, so I, I think that they do global shipping, but I wouldn't swear to yeah. it. No, but it, but there'd have to be some back and forward to work that out, I'm, I'm guessing, because... I, I, um, it, it's, it's worth... If anybody is interested, by all means, drop me a note. You can come to the contact page, drop me a note, and we'll make it happen. You know, we'll, we'll figure out. But this is, this is a collection of the, of the birds... Uh, and each one, you know, you click on it and each one has the accompanying text. And, um, you know, it's, it's the record, in a sense, it's the record of the last two years of my life. Uh, it, is a, it is a meaningful uh, journey that I've taken together with people. And, uh, and of course, this is the podcast version um, where folks can, can listen. Now there, there's there's a ripper picture. Let me let let's get that one up. Um, ah, yeah. So that's the beauty, isn't it? Yeah. So you know, this is a fun one. Uh, in fact, I'm going to be teaching at a church uh, next month, and I'm teaching about this photo, and and how. Let, 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 let's point out the different elements it, it, in the photo because yeah because it'll be difficult for people to see i think but uh if can can you see the cursor moving around there yeah um, a little bit now that's the sparrow nest right i i think because so, i reckon i can see two eggs there yeah i think that's right i think so, that's right so so sparrow's found himself a uh, a nice crevice to to build his messy nest in but the um 
which woodpecker is that? It's a, it's a red belly bellied. Bell. So it's not mm-hmm. the yellow bellied sapsucker. No. Uh, <laughs> uh, no. And and it's just doing what what woodpeckers do. That's right. <laughs> Probably not having a clue that he's um, coming up to, you know, exactly. Casa, Casa del House Sparrow. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a fascinating. Again, the, you know the the interactions that you get to see when you're out in the trails, as as often as I am, uh, is is really special. And these two, you know, you, for you who knows birds, uh, you see the differences. You know, you know that that's a sparrow and a and a and a woodpecker. Some people, you know, they'll look at this photo and and you know you say, well, what do they have something in common or are they different? And if you were to ask a biologist, uh, you know, what do you see? He's going to say two birds. In other words, these two birds are very distinct from one another from a bird perspective. But if I put those two up on the screen with a snake and a bear and a fish, yeah, uh, yeah. then they're, you know, then they're grouped together. Then they're alike. Exactly. Then they're alike. Yeah. And, and the question of difference versus sameness is a question of perspective. It's not inherent. It's about perspective. And that's one of the things that I'm, I'm looking forward to teaching. Um, because as I say, I'm teaching Jewish wisdom uh, at a church next month, and it's going to be wonderful. And we're going to look at what are the things that are common? What are the things that are distinct? Uh, and, and, you know, many of our, shall we say, disagreements, like you see in this photo, uh, can go away when we realize how, how much we actually have in common. The, the photo is really cool too in that um, I don't know if you took this uh, just auto autofocus or whether you had um, well obviously the the uh, the sparrows in flight so um, so I'm guessing the camera did all of all the work for you but the it's fantastic that the the really clear focus is on the uh, lichen on this branch on the left uh, it, it it draws you away from the conflict in in a way that makes the the conflict uh more interesting for me and that the the woodpecker head is just ever so slightly out of focus it's um it's a really great image and that's one of the things i love about modern uh, the modern equipment that uh, that we have that you could never have set up for that. Right. Right. Yeah. You're, you're, I mean, I, I shoot in uh, manual focus or manual mode rather auto focus, but manual mode. Yeah. In manual um, mode. Yeah. And, uh, and as you say, um, sometimes the camera, uh, suggests, uh, some artistic changes that maybe I don't want. Um, and, uh, as you say, Oftentimes, the things that we get inadvertently uh, end up being more meaningful than what we intended, and I think there's a lesson in that as well. Yeah, I, I, I think that's a that's a that's a beautiful shot. Thank you. Um, and uh, of course, um, the this is one of the podcast episodes, right? So it's really easy to listen to all of the uh, episodes on the website, but you've you've got it out in pod feeds as well right it's it's uh you can find avian rebbe on apple and spotify um and i think on google as well and you can it, yeah generally if it's in the apple feed and the spotify feed it'll probably get picked up by all the other uh services that mm. just use the apple feed uh anyway um so that's cool and you can get on the email list just by um, going to subscribe on your website and there it is. You can uh, get your uh, weekly dose of avian birdie goodness. Yeah, there's, <laughs> uh, as you say, from uh, there in the top right corner of the website, uh, if you just click on free birdie goodness, in the top yeah, right up, corner up yeah. here on the button that's right. that uh that'll get you signed up for the email list and that's that's actually i i think that's probably the richest way to stay in touch um i i put 
the most of me into uh, the emails that I send out on a weekly basis. Um, okay, so so that's your that's where mostly your energy goes to, and not into the the podcasting uh, side of it. I mean, look, it, that's that's six, actually a good point. It's probably you know what it probably takes the same. It, it, it it's probably fairly similar. It's probably fairly similar because of the the backstory that I that I narrate with the with the podcast. Yeah, and. Uh, and I reckon sometimes it's harder to do a short podcast because you have to, a short podcast for people to remember has to be much right. better than yeah. for an hour long rambling right. with, with, <laughs> with uh, that I like to do because um, it's much harder. It's, it's harder to write a haiku than to write right. an essay. That's exactly right. That's exactly Sorry there. Uh, my friends on Twitch, I have to pull pull up stumps uh, now. Cricketing term. Uh, means I have to pull the pin. Um, I'll return to this t- tomorrow if you, um, if you like. <clears throat> um, but no, I've got to actually, I've got to actually head off now. It's not bad, nearly five hours of... Uh, of bird stuff today so tomorrow i'm going to run another daryl jones episode uh that includes holly parsons and it's uh a, we've titled it uh reconnecting or connecting our frag fragmented environment i think um but it's basically about how do you get you know, good habitat in a city or a suburb connected to another bit and another bit and another bit. Um, you know, are we even thinking about it enough? Uh, so that's what's going to be happening. Um, so that will be Australian Eastern Daylight Time, which I think is... UTC plus eleven. Um, yeah, I think that I think that's uh, I think that's right. Uh, yeah, so check it out. Uh, check it out. Okay, thanks. I've I've enjoyed going over these uh, old older episodes and remembering what we talked about i'm always amazed at how much we cover when we when we're chatting so anyway that's me i'm grant see ya